Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get started uh, as people continue to join and log in. Uh, my name is Adim Kwaja. I'm a uh, burns and plastic surgeon in Manchester in the UK and uh, chair of the organizing committee for the two symposia on uh, burn care in low middle income countries hosted by BFIRST, VBA and BAPRAS. And I'd like to extend you our warmest welcome to this online symposium. So We've delegates registered from 75 countries from around the world as shown here in green, which is quite amazing really. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody from across the different continents and time zones, of course, who have joined today. Um, one, or two, uh, one of the um, uh, two events today, um, we have over 30 faculty from around the world. Please do look at their full biography details on the Be First webpage. Uh, we're very grateful for the time they're giving uh, to make this event a success. Uh, so um, please do take a moment to read that. Just a few final requests and uh, tips to try and getting the most out of uh, today's event. Uh, thanks to everyone who filled in the pre-event survey with the registration. The link is still active on the Be First webpage, so do take a minute uh, to do that if you can. It's really helpful for future events. Please do ask any questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll aim to answer as many as possible as we go along. We might not be able to get through all of them, but we'll do our best. The recording of this session will be put on the website around a week's time, as well as some additional resources uh, that the speakers have given to us, so keep an eye out for that. Online teaching is uh, quite exciting. This gives us many opportunities, including this session today, but it does bring some new considerations, and we do really ask you that you don't distribute any screenshots on social media. Uh, uh, there are many clinical uh, images in the presentations, and we'd be very grateful if you bear that in mind. To keep you all involved, um, we'll be asking some polling questions at the start of each session. Just answer as honestly as you can. It'll help the speakers understand what you're facing uh, in the audience. So that's all the main things for the day. I'll talk to you again at the end about the feedback and getting your certificates of attendance. And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Tucker, who's a plastic surgeon in Oxford in the UK. Uh, and the current chair of Be First to say a few words of welcome. Uh, I've got a short video to play for that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as the chair of Be First, I want to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, we're very grateful to Nadine for bringing together this collaboration between Be First and BBA. And my thanks go to the organising committee and those who've worked behind the scenes to bring this all together and to make it happen, as well as the international faculty who've joined us from across four continents. If you don't know much about Be First, we're a charity that aims to work in partnership with local surgeons in less well-resourced environments in order to train and empower them. 
We're not the owners of all the expertise and we don't pretend to be in a position to tell our partners what to do. We aim to support them to develop their own service and even to become leaders in the field themselves. You'll notice that many people in the, involved in this uh, collaborative webinar are the very ones who work in these difficult circumstances. So part of our role is to facilitate local surgeons being able to share their expertise that's gained from years of working in this environment, which means that what you get from this webinar today will be grounded in reality. If after being a part of this webinar, you feel that you would like to be uh, more involved in partnership with Be First, then please feel free to contact us, which you can easily do through the Be First website or by responding through the email at which you were sent your registration details. And now, without further delay, I will hand you back to the chair. Thank you. Have a good time. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, for those uh, comments. Uh, so I'm uh, going to um, uh, going to just pass over now to the uh, two chair for the first session. The first chair is uh, Mr. Oren Shelley, who is a uh, plastic surgeon in Chelmsford in the UK and Dublin in Ireland. Uh, he's a trustee of the British Burn Association and the chairman of Research Africa. And his co-chair today is Dr. Richard Nabuka a uh, burn and plastic surgeon in Nigeria. He's the past president of the Nigerian Burn uh, Society, as well as the Pan-African Burn Society and a trustee of Interburn. So Oren, I'm going to pass over to you, if that's all right, for your first polling question. Uh, thank you, Nadim. Uh, I, I think it's a privilege to be part of this um, first webinar on burn care. And the first session will be uh, acute burn care in low middle income countries and we will be hearing from a number of people across the world. Uh, first question please. So I'd really like you to give us an indication of uh, where you're from. You've already seen the slide. Uh, over a thousand people registered from 75 countries. So be very grateful if you could tell us where you're from please. Okay, could I have the next question, please? Okay, so this is really interesting. We have the online results uh, to show us where everybody is from. That's wonderful, a lot from Asia and Africa. So it's important for us to understand better um, who's here joined with us today because Burn Care is very definitely a multidisciplinary team effort and uh, we hope to continue this shared learning. So if you could tell us what your role in burn care is, surgeon, other doctor, a nurse, a therapist, or other healthcare worker. Thank you. Well, so as expected, uh, a lot of surgeons have joined us today, but we're delighted to see other doctors and other professionals, particularly nurses. Next. And we would like to know how often you treat patients with burn injuries. Is that daily, frequently, occasionally, or rarely? Thank you. So this is great to see that this is a very relevant topic for almost everybody here who are treating burns either frequently or daily basis. Next. And uh, finally, we would like to, to know a little bit more about you. Have you got a protected burn service? Are there beds that are exclusively yours that you can use or are there allocated beds for uh, burn patients that you always are always available. Thank you. So interesting, most people have got a um, burn allocated beds. Thank you very much for the polling and thank you all the participants for uh, giving us that feedback. Um, I'd like to open our first session, which is uh, reflecting 
uh, burn care across the world um, in low middle income countries. And I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Nye Moyman from Birmingham uh, in the UK. He is the current president of the International Association of Burn Injury, ISBI, and the past president of European and the British Burn Association. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. <clears throat> My name is Naeem Moyman, and um, before everything, it's like to see um, and um, a lot of colleagues and friends are logged in and uh, joining this wonderful webinar. And uh, it's good morning in the um, in the in the, in the Americas, and uh, good afternoon in the uh, in other parts of the world here in Europe, and uh, good evening in India and Asia. So it's great to see everybody from across the world. I'd like to thank B First and BAPRAS and the British Burn Association for organizing this webinar. Special thanks should go to Najim Kawaja for his relentless effort to make this happen. I'm fully aware of how much time and effort he spent during the last month to organize this wonderful webinar. Global incidence of burns is of paramount importance both in high and low income countries. Accurate knowledge is important to allocate resources and allow us to design effective prevent prevention programs. In the next few minutes, I will share with you global view of burn incidents with a special emphasis on gaps in our knowledge and the way forward to address these gaps. I would like also to share with you what we can learn from other successful global initiatives in low income countries, namely Global Alliance of Cook Stoves and the Lancet Commission for Global Surgery. This map shows a proportion of people in a particular country living on less than $1.90 per day these data was collected from the United Nations in 2016. This is not much dissimilar from burn incidence distribution across the globe. Unfortunately, burns is closely associated with communities with low socioeconomic standards. This map is based on data from Center of Global Burden of Disease in 2002 when the center was originally funded by the World Bank and the WHO. Now based in Seattle, is funded privately by the Gates Foundation, among other NGOs and international corporates. The striking difference between the two maps is the relative small size of the African continent. This can only be explained by the incomplete and inadequate data on the incidence of burns in every African country. This graph represents longitudinal mortality trends per 100,000 population in a sample of low and medium income countries over a period of 27 years. Although there is a definite positive trends of decline in death from fire almost in every country, mortality in low income countries are still almost double or treble that of the United States, Sweden, or Britain. Unfortunately, data in low income and medium income countries in this graph are based on modeling and trends using measure of exposure and exposure risk methodology. And rightly, some public health experts in global burns would challenge the validity of these data. As burns professionals, we owe it to our patients that we should have accurate and meaningful data for burn incidents in our communities. Data is a power. No government or non-government organization would invest any significant amount of money in burns program without accurate and meaningful data to ensure efficacy. The Global Alliance for Cooking Stoves was established in 2012 with the ambition to raise $3 billion. The Alliance of Philanthropists, 
multinational corporates, NGOs, and international organizations all work together under the umbrella of the United Nations Foundation. The aim was to produce and deploy clean cook stoves to 100 million households. Traditional house cooking with open fire and kerosene stoves cause air pollution, which is 100, more, 100 times the recommended permissible level by the WHO. This kills an estimate of 2 million people every year. And this is not counting death caused by fire. Regrettably, safety wasn't considered as an objective at the time because we didn't have present valid global burns data uh, when they started. The Alliance successfully surpassed the target and raised $3.2 billion as they were able to demonstrate the positive financial impact of the project is higher for every dollar spent than HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis research investments. The second global initiative was the Lancet Commission for Global Surgery. This project has succeeded in putting surgery for the first time in the World Health Agenda. Again, there are lessons to be learned. The Lancet Commission of Global Surgery was launched in January 2014 with a vision to provide safe, high quality, affordable surgery when it is needed to everybody in the world. First, the program mapped out access to surgery in most of the countries in the world, in low and high income countries. And they explored good practice in deprived areas that could be scalable to other regions in the low income countries. One of the good practice identified was in Mozambique, uh, where is the use of non-physician practitioners to perform cesarean sections, hernias, and fixed fractures. Those practitioners were performing 60% of these procedures in Mozambique. Once trained, they are unlikely to leave their villages for better life in big cities or other countries. Lessons we can learn in burn care. An objective was to define surgical indicators that can be included in the WHO global reference list that all member states are obliged to measure. The most significant achievement of the Lancet Commission for Global Surgery was the adoption of three surgical indicators in the 100 list of the WHO. These were the perioperative mortality rate, surgical workforce density, and also the catastrophic and the impoverishing expenses, which means the out-of-pocket expenses in, in poor communities. Inclusion in this book ensures that the WHO member states are obliged to report these indicators, which is a great step in achieving access to surgery every, to, for everyone. In conclusion, before the turn of the millennium, Excellent burned registries were established in several high income countries that led to improving quality of burn care and robust prevention programs that reduced the incidence and also the mortality of burns injuries in most age groups in these countries. In the last 10 years, successful milestones initiatives, namely the Cook Stove Alliance and the Global Surgery Programs, can give us a leading light to start similar global initiatives that can only be achieved by collaboration. And as I said, we owe this to our patients. At the end, I would like to invite you all to our combined ISBI and the British Burn Association Congress in Birmingham in June of next year. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Naeem, for that excellent talk. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on and Richard will introduce the uh, next speaker for us um, and we'll take questions at the end. Yeah, thank you very much, <coughs> Oren. <coughs> Excuse me. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kemi Ayoade. He's a plastic surgeon from Lagos, Nigeria, and she's based at the National Orthopedic Hospital in Lagos. And she is a previous BFIRST BAPRAS International Fellow. So, ladies and gentlemen, can we give uh, the next uh, eight minutes to Dr. Kemi? Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to share with you today some of the challenges facing emergency bone care in Lagos, southwestern part of Nigeria. Nigeria currently has a population of over 200 million people. Lagos is actually the smallest state in terms of land mass, but has the highest concentration density with about 20 million inhabitants. It also has the highest number of plastic surgeons in the country. There are four government-owned tertiary institutions that manage both adult and pediatric burns, and the number of available protected bone beds versus bone specialists is as projected. Managing bones in our environment is quite tedious, as a vast majority of those sustaining bones are those who really cannot afford the care. Most of the incidents leading to these bone injuries are actually preventable errors in judgment. By far, the commonest cause of burn is from domestic petrol fire. The average Nigerian is a passionate football fan, especially of the English Premier League, and they watch all the matches live. Those who cannot afford cable satellite subscription still get to watch their favorite matches live at these viewing centers for a small token. It's not the football that actually causes the bonds. Most of these viewing centers, and indeed most households in the country, are powered by these generators due to irregular electric power supply. The consequence of this is that people tend to store petrol in the homes in large quantity, leading to frequent fire outbreaks. During a football match, when the generator gets low on fuel, some will rather not interrupt the match and try to refuel the generator while it is still running. Some of the petrol spills on the hot cylinders, causing an explosion, leading to major bone injuries like this. Another common presentation of burns is from domestic gas explosion. The use of LPG gas is quite common in most homes. And what we usually preach is that they site the gas cylinders outside of the kitchen area, but most can't afford to for fear of them being stolen, so they are kept in the kitchen. Most of the kitchens are usually poorly ventilated as well, with one door and a window, which is usually closed as seen in the picture. The consequence of this is that when there is gas leakage within this confined space, an explosion usually occurs. Scald bones are also very common in children, especially the toddlers. Most poor homes do not have hot water running in the taps. So to bathe their children, mothers will usually boil water in an electric kettle such as this and transport that kettle from the kitchen to the bathroom. And sometimes the toddlers run into them on the way and get scalded in the process. The second major challenge is the local belief that applying raw eggs, toothpaste, cornstarch actually soothes the bone. And the consequence of this is that they get to introduce infectious agents early on into the bone wounds. There is no luxury of ambulance service or 911 over here, so relatives have to transport the bone victim to the nearest hospital. For smaller degree bonds, they get treated at these small centers where there is usually no specialist and only get referred to a specialist if complications develop. However, for major bonds, they are referred earlier due to inability to get IV access. Some have to travel from rural areas to get to the city, spending hours on the road with little or no resuscitation. On getting to the tertiary centers, however, they are told they have to pay a deposit 
to get admitted onto the born ward or to have theater procedures. Only about 10% of Nigerians are covered by the National Health Insurance Scheme. So most patients we see have to pay for their care out of pocket. This causes a delay while they look for funds and things like intravenous fluid, antibiotics, anticoagulants are staggered and they are not purchased on time, consequently leading to increase in mortality. At presentation at our centers, we usually achieve IV access through a central venous line. If an escarotomy is needed, it is usually done in the emergency room via light sedation because we can't get to theater to do that. We also give them a warm ibitem bath to wash off all the contaminants that may have been applied. If the patient can afford specialized dressings like Acticoat or Therabond, they have to be ordered from the companies because the hospitals does not stock them. Otherwise, our usual dressing agents are Demazine or Honey or Povidone with Bactigras 2. Our multidisciplinary team consists of the plastic surgeon, our nurse, trained nurses, physical therapist, dietitian, a psychotherapist, and a social welfare, whose main role is to help source for funds from corporate organizations. This is our bone center. We run an open ward center with about eight beds and a two bed cubicle. We do not have ICU facilities attached to our bone center and the surgeon usually takes on the role of the intensivist most times. The 450 bed orthopedic hospital where I work has a four bed ICU, mainly for trauma patients. So the anesthetists are usually very reluctant to put bone patients on one of the two available ventilators for fear of tying the machine down for weeks. Pain management, especially during dressings on the ward, is not so good. Only occasionally do we get the high-end opioids like morphine and pethidine. The cheaper drug which is readily available is pentazosin and usually leave the survivors with a serious addiction problem. Finally, we have a challenge in what to cover the wound, especially when we have major bones after tendential excision. Where there is a donor site, we usually crop and wrap the donor site with upside as seen and mesh graft and cover to cover as much of the surface as we can. We do not have skin banking services or local source for cadaver skin. And skin substitutes are far too expensive for our patients to afford. We do fairly well in bonds less than 40%, but when the bond severity is over 50 and above, and especially in older patients who have comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes, it is usually tougher. The number one cause of mortality is pulmonary embolism. Dear colleagues and listeners, these are just a few of the challenges we face when managing bone patients in a low and medium income country such as us. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kemi, for that uh, excellent talk reflecting on uh, burn care in Nigeria. Um, we will hopefully come back to you with some questions at the end. But now I'd like to proceed to welcome uh, Dr. Nikki Biggs. She is a consultant in emergency medicine in London and is the lead for a collaborative project between Health Improvement Project Zanzibar and Be First, working towards improving burn care across the island of Zanzibar. Many thanks. Hello, Nikki. Oh, can you hear me? We can now, yes. Oh, beg your pardon. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all about the challenges of burn care in Zanzibar. So just to set the scene a little bit for you, so Zanzibar is an archipelago off the coast of Tanzania with a population of 1.3 to 1.4 million people. The average life expectancy is 57 years old, which is nearly 10 years below the worldwide average. 
the average annual income is only about $250, meaning about half of Zanzibar's population live below the poverty line. Looking at healthcare in Zanzibar, so about 7% of children in Zanzibar are affected by malnutrition, and this is one of the most common causes for admission in the under fives. Infant mortality is about 54 in 1,000 live births, and child mortality is about 73. There are three public hospitals across the island, um, two district, hopefully soon to be regional hospitals, Kivunge in the north and Makanduchi in the south. And the tertiary referral hospital is Nazimoja, which is in the Stone Town capital. The typical presentation of a burn injury in Zanzibar is that of a toddler. The true incidence isn't known. However, it's my experience that this is the third most common presentation warranting admission. Central data confirms that this is the most common trauma admission across the whole island. Schooled injuries are by far the most common etiology. However, particularly during the month of Ramadan, we see an increase in burn injuries and fall onto open flame is the next most common cause. First aid is not normally given and it's my experience that understanding about first aid is very poor and the children will normally present with a kanga covering the burn, but which this time has normally become adherent to the burn wound. Adults are affected by burn injuries, but in much fewer numbers. Falls or a seizure resulting in fall onto an open flame is probably the most common cause. And unfortunately, self-immolation is seen on a fairly regular basis as well. So children will normally present on the day of injury and they will present either to their local PHCU, which is their primary health care unit, or to the, the district hospital if it's closer. Um, very late presentations, so months or years after the injury when the child presents with contractures, certainly in patient settings, but this is comparatively rare. The number of children seen at PHCUs and managed in the community is not data that is known. Um, but we do know that the number of children presenting to district hospitals are normally managed there without further referrals. Whilst an inpatient, the children will have dressing changes every day or every other day. The supply of dressings used to be variable. Once hospital, hospital supplies were depleted, the families would be tasked to buy these and the price was normally not one within their budget, but thankfully these are now supplied by local charity. Silver X cream is the topical dressing cream used and that is widely available. Fluids are not normally indicated given the nature of burn seen. However, for the few where it is, the challenges of administration without pumps and sometimes without burettes means that this is just not practical. However, all patients are routinely given a five day course of IV antibiotics. Opioids aren't permitted in the district hospital, so analgesia is in the form of paracetamol and ibuprofen. And currently routine analgesia or analgesia prior to dressing change is not currently an embedded practice. As I said, most children are managed locally, um, but for those with significant burns or those needing surgery are referred on to Nazimoja in Stone Town. What you see in the photo is the paediatric surgical ward at Nazimoja Hospital and behind the glass window in the top left is the what's called the burns box. So this is where children are isolated here for infection control purposes and they are looked after by the general paediatric surgical nursing and medical teams. The team here certainly have the capabilities for surgical procedures such as escherotomies. However, the nature of burns seen here means that's not normally warranted. The surgical teams are very familiar with skin grafting and it's often used for other pathologies such as um, ulcers. However, the team here have not had specific training in burn surgical management. Grafting is often carried out, but comparatively late and often with the support of visiting surgical teams. The majority of burn injuries sustained in Zanzibar are survivable. However, in October last year, three men were injured in a gas explosion and sustained greater than 50% total body surface area burns. Tragically, they all died. There is no, currently no data to explore the long-term morbidity associated with burn injuries either. However, the future is looking brighter. Both Kivunga and Makanduchi now have full-time physiotherapists employed by the Ministry of Health, and they are both passionate for burn care. HIPS, the Health Improvement Project Zanzibar, the charity that I work with, have joined forces with Be First, and we are currently in the process of developing a strategy alongside the Ministry of Health to, introduce, to reduce the incident of burn injury and to improve burn management. 
Thank you very much for your time. I've included my email there and be very happy to be contacted. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Nikki, uh, for that uh, talk, showing us your great experience in um, Tanzania and uh, Zanzibar. Uh, Richard will now introduce our next speaker. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Raja Krishnan, who is a consultant plastic surgeon at Ganga Hospital in uh, in India, and um, he will be taking us through the next presentation for uh, another eight minutes. He's been trained at Ganga and in India, and he's currently uh, establishing a bond unit there, having finished his fellowship at St. Andrews, Chelmsford. Dr. Raja, you have a floor. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone all over the world. I'd like to thank everyone from BBA and BFIRST for giving me this opportunity. My topic is challenging challenges facing emergency burn care in the Indian perspective. So India is a land of 1.3 billion with multiple cultures, religions, languages. We do have a lot of good stuff, like we, we have put a, a spacecraft onto Mars at the, at the cost it takes to make a, a Hollywood movie. At the same time, we have extreme poverty. So that's what Mark Twain has told. This is indeed India, the land of dreams and romance, of fabulous wealth and fabulous poverty, of splendor and rags, of palaces and hovels. If you see the burn problem in India, there are around 7 million burns in India every year, and most of them are preventable, 90 percentage are preventable, and most occur in the productive age group between 20 to 40 years. 45 percentage they, uh, are uh, taken care of by government hospitals and 55 percentage are taken care of by private institutions. And if you see the major burn center in, in India, there are around 67 major burn centers with 1,339 beds with uh, 0.1 per 100,000 population, 297 uh, ICU beds with 79 percentage have dialysis. So we, we, for the population that we have, we do have a less number of uh, beds. So if you look into what the Lancet has told, the Lancet has said that for emergency procedures to be good, they need to be available within two hours to, uh, for, to, have, a good, uh, to, be, uh, to have a good coverage. And if you can see how are we faring, we fare that 75 percentage are within two hours from a designated burn center, 64 percentage are two hours within a burn specific ICU, 21.8 percentage have an access to a skin bank and 15.9 percentage only have access to both an ICU and as well as a skin bank. Now, why do we need the skin banks locally? Because the skin uh, allografts are very essential to treat major burns and they can be extremely co costly and having them locally, it makes the procurement easy and the demand for the product is a lot. So presently we have around nine skin banks predominantly within the, uh, with the South India and uh, Central India. If we look into the age and gender distribution, uh, you can find that um, most of them are actually within the uh, within less than 40 years of age. That means uh, most of the people are within the productive age group of less than 40 years. And if you can see the relationship between the age group and the total body surface area, you can see we have a lot of major burns. And that is what the medium total body surface area shows. And if we see the etiology of burns, if out of 103 uh, people, there are around 45, which is accidental, which could be preventable, 25 are suicide, eight are homicide, uh, five are incidental, uh, helping out others, and 15 are uh, scales, and five are electric. So which means that a lot of them are actually preventable and a lot of work needs to be done here. And how is the fire extinguished? So we all know that uh, pouring water is one of the best methods to, uh, to extinguish fire. It was done only in 55 percentage, and uh, and uh, uh, the uh, bed sheets were covered in 35 percentage. Victims rolled on the ground in 15 percentage, and sand was thrown on 4 percentage. So now there's the two uh, uh, things that we have: either we scoop and run, or whether we stay and play. Generally, it is told that especially in lower middle income countries, scoop and run is, is definitely better. And we found the 55 percentage came to us within three hours of the burn. 
And if you think and see what the rest of the 45 percentage did, only IV fluids was given only in 49 percentage, analgesics in 40 percentage, some ointments in 17, we just the people just referred in 19 percentage, and three people just three percentage gave only herbal extracts. So what it means to say, is say that uh, scope and run is definitely a better policy because the policy, the uh, care elsewhere is not that great. So scope and run policy is a better policy for developing countries like us. And if you see the mortality, and the, uh, none above 60 percentage have uh, survived in this study. And there's considerable amount of mortality uh, in the 41 to 60 uh, age group, and even some mortality within the 21 to 40 percentage, which is it's seen in there in almost all this, uh, which is very similar in most of the other studies. This is it in contrast to the West, wherein it has been told that uh, that mortality as an endpoint to, uh, to assess advances is uh, losing validity because of the reduction in burn related deaths. So that we have a totally two different spectrums, and I think this is because. The both uh, uh, both people manage burns very very differently. Now, why is the mortality high? It is because we have high caseload with major burns. We need more personnel. We need to improve this infrastructure in terms of IC beds and theaters. We need to train more doctors, nurses, anesthetists, and intensivists interested in burn care. And when the ICU improves, surgeons can excise more. The other thing that I keep noticing uh, in uh, India is that. We have a lot of high uh, multi-drug resistant organisms. So when you have a lot of uh, high multi-drug resistant organisms, like for example, uh, organisms which are only sensitive to colistin, we have antibiotics for only for 10 days. So we need more infection control practices. So where is the problem? Is it the money? Well, money is, is a problem in certain cases, but I don't think even if you're going to pump money, I think results are going to change. Is it the talent? I don't think so because Indian surgeons are quite talented and they do complex microsurgeries as well. Is it the infrastructure? I don't think it is that much uh, important because all you need is that uh, you need theaters, measures, dermatomes, ventilators, and uh, quite a lot of uh, institutions have all of them, but still the uh, results aren't very great. So what are my thoughts on how we can improve? First and foremost, we need to prevent the unnecessary burn so that our load decreases. And then we need to move on to early excisions just like in the West because uh, if you're going to have antibiotics only for 10 days with high number of multi drug resistant organisms, we need to move on to early excisions. And our ICU care and doctors need to improve so that uh, surgeons can go on for early excisions. And we need a better team work, teamwork between anesthetists, surgeons, uh, uh, nurses, and other healthcare workers. And we also need to uh, improve our infection control practices to get our results much better. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you uh, very much, Raja, for uh, sharing your great experience with, uh, with burn care in India and the different challenges that are um, evident there. Thank you, sir. I'd like to next introduce uh, Professor Tariq Iqbal. He is a burn consultant in Pakistan at the Institute of Medical Sciences, Islamabad, Pakistan. He trained in uh, plastic surgery in Islamabad and also in Seattle in the United States. And he has established a state-of-the-art burn care facility in Islamabad, and his mission is to provide standardized burn care throughout the country. Thank you. Do we have sound? Apologies. Good evening to everyone. I'm working at Pakistan Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, the largest tertiary care hospital of Islamabad, the capital city of Pakistan. Pediatrics and adult burns. 
a burn takes a minute to occur and a lifetime to be treated incorrectly. And a lot of this inadequate treatment is being done uh, in developing world. At 14th Congress of uh, uh, I, uh, IFEI in 2008 at Montreal, uh, after some hot discussion from the delegates of low-income countries, including myself, uh, mission statement was agreed to have a minimum standards of burn care across the globe. One world, one standard of burn care. The same slogan was the theme of 2012 uh, uh, ISBI conference at Edinburgh. But now, in 2020, I still feel that a lot more needs to be done to achieve this goal. Globally, 95% of the fire-related burns they occur in uh, low and middle income countries. And majority of these are happening in Southeast Asia. As you can see that mortality per 100,000 is 11.6 in Southeast Asia as compared to one in high income countries. Uh, the high income countries improve it by not only having a specialized burn care for everyone, but also implementing a very effective prevention strategies like uh, smoke detectors, regulation of hot water heat and temperature, flame resistance children wear, and uh, housing codes and safety electrical wiring. Just for example, that smoke detectors associated with 61% reduction in the risk of death from residential house fires in USA. Uh, Community-based prevention strategies has decreased burn-related hospital admissions among Norway children by 52%. A study shows that a dollar spent on uh, smoke detectors saves the $28 spent on health-related expenditures. Uh, in Pakistan, burns continue to remain a challenging problem due to lack of infrastructure, both in public and private hospitals, lack of trained professionals, doctors and paramedical staff. There's very high cost of the treatment, and practically there's no prevention strategies. And there are only 10 burn units for the huge population of 220 billion. Uh, we not, do not only need the infrastructure, uh, but we need multidisciplinary approach to treat a critical burn patients. At our center, just to give you an idea that how much burden we are facing, we have treated more than 145,000 patients in the last 12 years with 6,600 uh, admissions. And in just last year, we have treated more than 23,000 uh, uh, acute burn patients uh, with overall recovery of 84% of those who are admitted. Uh, male are slightly more, 54%. Winter is associated with slightly increased incidence of uh, 20%. Uh, second degree burn is the most common and pediatric burn are the almost uh, half of these patients. Uh, Flame is the commonest cause followed by the scales and the electrical burns. As you can see that the chemical burns are very small in number, just 0.2% of the total burns. Uh, home, because of the pediatric burns, remain the commonest place followed by the workplace and uh, the mortality increases as the percentage of burn is and the depth of the burn increases. This is an important slide. Uh, is showing the difference of outcome of two healthcare scenarios of my country and their impact. Uh, one is the specialized burn care, which are few and the results are comparable with the high income countries and other are general hospitals with a huge difference in the outcome. And this is the point which needs to be addressed effectively by having necessary infrastructure and trained staff in these hospitals. Another problem that we are facing uh, 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 because of the establishment of the specialized center is that the uh, other hospitals almost have stopped treating these patients even for emergency care and treatment. And keeps on referring these patients to specialized center resulting in a loss of precious times and which can be uh, of value in saving these lives. Uh, ma making infrastructure is, of course, is the job of the government, but to uh, overcome the training aspect, we have started different teaching programs to train burn specialists, doctors, and nurses. 
And to conclude, my recommendation will be establishing burn centers in all big cities and burn units in all teaching hospitals and burn wards in all district hospitals. Establishing local standard guideline, guidelines and protocols for the acute burn management, which should be cost effective and using digital health techniques like smartphone based applications for burn assessment and initial management uh, of these patients and having a burn registry to have the database of these burn patients. And uh, the main focus should be on prevention uh, for which a, Q, uh, a public uh, health approach is required. And uh, there could be different strategies for that we can fix one national or international burn awareness day or week in this regard, and various national and international organizations can be of great help uh, for these low and middle income countries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Harry uh, Kikpal for a fantastic talk. Richard. and the types of Hello? Yes. Thank you, Richard. You have the floor. Are you hearing me? We can indeed. Ah, good. Yeah, thank you very much. Our last speaker for this session is uh, Sean Folder who is a burn and plastic surgeon in Liverpool, UK, and she's had a long-standing partnership with Kanti Hospital in Kanti Children's Hospital in Kathmandu, Nepal. And she is also a trustee of Interburns and has worked for many years with them in quality improvement for burn care in low and middle income countries. And that is what she'll be talking about in the next uh, 22 plus minutes quality improvement for bone care in low and middle income countries. Uh, may I present to you, Shian Folder. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting an overview Hello, of the factors to consider in improving. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting an overview of the factors to consider in improving burn outcomes for our patients in LMICs and to talk through the Interburns approach. Interburns is the international network for training, education and research in burns and it was set up in 2006 as an NGO and charity to try to address the disparity between burn care that's offered in high income countries compared to low income countries. And it's comprised of a group of very committed and passionate um, professionals who formed a global network to work towards this aim. And it is really fantastic to see that so many of our speakers today and our chairs uh, come from the Interburns Network. We should just consider what it is we're trying to achieve uh, in terms of good outcomes, because historically it's been mortality that has driven improvement. Whereas now in high income countries, so many patients survive severe burn injury, the emphasis now is looking at quality of life on having good functional and aesthetic outcomes. This is just a representative curve to try and illustrate the bone care improvement journey, showing that when we started in the 1940s and 50s, the LD50 for burn injury was 45%. That means that only half of patients with a burn of this size would survive. Whereas now in 2020, the best institutions in the world will have an LD50 of 95%. So over 80 years, there have been a number of staged improvements that have gradually brought about this change. And that includes improvements in infection control and fluid resuscitation and surgery. But what is interesting to see is that over the last 30 years or so, the improvement in mortality is leveling off. And really, the improvements have been directed more towards quality improvement. And these have been things that are really quite expensive and technological, such as synthetic skin, fractionated laser and other technological advancements. So we've heard from many speakers this morning about the challenges faced in low and middle income countries. 
And we know that the balance between the needs of the population and the assets available uh, is completely opposite to what we find in high income countries. And that's because we have a much lower incidence of burn injury and that we have considerably uh, more resources. But it is also a fact that most of the research that's carried out in burns has been done in high income countries and for high income countries. And as I showed on the previous slide, the focus has been towards more expensive and technological improvements. And really, when thinking about burn care improvement, it may not be equivalent years, but we're certainly going to require a number of years for that burning improvement curve to catch up in LMICs. Some of us are working in really excellent uh, centres and in the LMICs there are going to be uh, really um, high quality services available, but it is also uh, not unexpected that in low resource areas, these are some of the outcomes that patients are facing. And what these pictures are showing is a really unacceptable level of pain and suffering for these individuals. But the deformity and disability that we see is preventable. And as clinicians working in institutions, we look at these photographs and we think quite on a personal level about what it is that we can do to bring about improvements for these patients. But we've also got to think a little bit more wider than that. It isn't simply what we can do individually. We've got to think about how can we improve outcomes for these patients collectively within the institution, but also across the country and within a region. And so we've got to think a little bit more broadly in a systems-based framework. The WHO has outlined system building blocks, blocks for improving uh, healthcare in a systematic way. And these are shown on the left, service de delivery, health workforce, information, medical products and technologies, financing, leadership and governance. And working to address these areas will lead to a more global uh, improvement for our patients, meaning that more of them will be able to access safe and high quality care. But I don't know about you, when I see uh, slides like this and I, I hear those titles, they don't ring uh, very, uh, they don't give me a great deal of enthusiasm and motivation. And I think it's nice to think about them in context of our burn patients and what they go through. So if we think about the burn patient journey, our patients start off as normal people in their societies and families. And as we've heard, they'll sustain uh, a number of different types of burn injuries and then for us become a patient. We've heard how there may be a number of challenges for those patients before they get to us in a healthcare institution. And then once we've given the treatment, we discharge those patients back into society and hope that they will start up their jobs, go back to school and return to be a fully functional member of their society. We ourselves are focusing quite often on the treatment that we give those patients in our institutions, but it's important that we think more widely. So we've heard that in high income countries, it is the primary prevention programs that have really brought down the incidence of burn injury. And that means that if we have fewer patients, then the balance between our needs and assets mean that we're able to give better quality treatments and get better outcomes. We've also know that these prevention uh, activities may lead to different types of burn injury that are not quite so severe. And we also know that effective and timely first aid will also uh, reduce the severity of the injury. And if our patients are less severely burned, we'll be able to get better outcomes. We've heard about the delays that mean that there's a problem for our patients, more likely to face infection and contractures. And if we start off from that point, it is gonna be difficult to achieve good outcomes. And once we discharge our patients back into society, if they're lost to follow up, if they have no further intervention, then it's more likely that they will suffer longer term consequences such as contractures, having deformity and disability, which means that they're much less likely to integrate back into society and return back to their pre-burn state. So considering this wider context, we can see where the building blocks of the WHO fit in. We can see that in our own institutions, it's important that our workforce is not only adequately trained, but that they're motivated and that they're reimbursed sufficiently for their work and that they're available in sufficient numbers to provide the care. 
And that will mean that we need to think about the balance between our resources and needs so that we can make sure that we're offering safe care uh, to our patients and that we're providing them with evidence-based uh, treatment and that we have the appropriate equipment to do so. We mentioned the importance of information and it is the timely collection of accurate, reliable and relevant data that's important to ensure that we can register the incidence of burn injury and that we know the effect of prevention activities and we talk about that in our second webinar but we also need to collect data within our own institutions so that we know how well our patients are doing and that we can monitor our outcomes. Of course, not everything is within our own sphere of influence, and that's where we need to act as advocates for our patients, working with governments to help set national policy with respect to burns, and that we work with other partners interested in burn care to bring about the best outcomes possible. And finally, that we all consider funding, not just national funding in country, but that we can look outside to donor funding and grant funding to bring about these changes. So over the years, Interburns has worked with very many people, have been a great deal of input to produce a comprehensive integrated framework to capacity building and quality improvement in burn care. And this relies on a cyclical framework around standards. It involves assessing services against those agreed standards and then implementing a tailored program of recommendations for capacity building. And then after an agreed time period, reducing the impact of those interventions to see if change has occurred. So with the setting of standards, uh, Interburns held a consensus conference in 2012, attended by 29 leaders in burns care from many countries across Asia and Africa to consider what are minimum achievable standards that should be ex uh, expected in low and middle income countries. And these we focused on operational standards within institutions um, that staff uh, and facilities will need to adhere to to really try and maximise outcomes of patients there. We also considered the educational principles and the types of training opportunities that would be required for the staff that would be trying to bring about those changes. So we produced a set of 25 standards which uh, are to uh, set uh, a level of care that should be expected uh, by burn patients. And the educational principles focused on really um, uh, considering things such as that they should be uh, sustainable uh, education programs, they should be contextual, they should be appropriate to the facilities where that training is taking uh, place and that they should be re reviewed and responsive to feedback. During that conference, we also followed the WHO uh, trauma assessments to consider three levels of service. So level one is uh, a basic uh, level, a primary healthcare facility where there may not be medical staff. Level two is for the usual district general hospitals that may treat burn patients but not be specialised. And level three is advanced, more specialist care. We looked at the knowledge, skills, facilities and equipment and agreed what should be available and required to be able to bring about the best outcomes for patients who were admitted and treated through those facilities. And this resource matrix provided the building blocks for assessment against the standards. So in order to do the assessment over a number of years with many participants, we've developed a set of participatory service evaluation tools. And there's a facilitator who's trained to bring about the best in teams and teams then work together using these tools to assess their services themselves against the standards. And we look at three things, the capacity of the facility, do they have the knowledge, skills, equipment and facilities available to be able to deliver burn care at that standard? And in fact, are they actually delivering that care and what are the outcomes for their patients? We then carry out a gap analysis with the teams to look at what needs uh, have to be met and then produce a tailored programme of recommendations and activities that can be implemented and agree a monitoring process where after an agreed period of time we can assess the impact of those interventions. 
So services who do this will have a scorecard like this, which has assessed their performance or they've assessed their own performance within 10 domains of burns care and scored out of 100 with one to 10 on each domain. And presented in this visual format like a traffic light system, it becomes easy to see where the gaps in service are. And then having worked together, the teams will look at what's within their sphere of influence and decide uh, with Interburns the recommendations uh, that uh, will take, be taken forward and what are the priority ones, in this case the three that are shown on the arrow here, that are going to make the biggest difference to burn care. And we have carried out uh, this uh, uh, system uh, between 2016 and 19 on seven services in Nepal and Bangladesh as the pilot study through a DFID grant and shown that there has been service improvement in every single facility that has followed this process. Some of the recommendations will centre around education and training of staff, which seems to be quite a universal need. And over the years, Interferns has worked to use the educational principles set by the standards to produce a, a comprehensive training portfolio. And this involves a set of face-to-face -face courses aimed at various levels of service and practitioner. Uh, there are also online versions and uh, um, alongside an Interverns uh, instructor training uh, program so that local faculty will take these courses on and um, they'll become sustainable. We've also held two training retreats, which is an opportunity to bring uh, burn care professionals from around a region together for networking uh, and motivational work and to learn clinical skills and non-clinical skills such as leadership and quality improvement. These all have a focus on knowledge to action and they've de been developed from the ground up to be contextually appropriate for low and middle income countries. So basic burn care is aimed really at the community level with a focus on prevention and first aid and the initial treatment of burn injuries and also assessment uh, to allow uh, those non-medical staff who treat these people to be able to refer them on to burn care services. And there's a fully resourced pack available to support the local uh, instructors for this. Essential burn care addra addresses a bit of a gap in the education market. So it isn't looking at just the major burns or the emergency care, but it's really trying to provide uh, a comprehensive overview of burn care uh, for the majority of survivable burns that are seen in LMICs to reduce the impact um, of those injuries and try to maximize outcomes. There's a full colour manual that goes with this one to two day course that uh, is very practical uh, and also has a focus on knowledge to action. And this has been developed in a number of countries uh, across Asia and Africa. And we can see the success of this by the fact that it's been delivered independently by local teams in a number of countries. And for example, in the Palestinian territories has now become part of the core medical curriculum. This is also available online. It's free to access through the website, both the course and the manual. And there's been a spike in demand for it through uh, COVID. The advanced burn care courses are for specific professionals. And these are more uh, intensive, interactive, practical five-day modules in specific areas of burn care, such as rehabilitation, nursing, and surgery. And again, these have been delivered successfully in several countries with an emphasis on hands-on experience, working with patients and simulation. We have four training centres, two in Nepal, one in India and one in South Africa. And you can see that this offers uh, opportunities for a number of fellows from across the world to take up one to six month placements. Predominantly, they've been surgeons, but also uh, from uh, the wider MDT, including some observers from higher income countries. So even though we know what needs to be done and the staff may have the education and training, we know that people don't always do uh, the right thing. And so it's important to consider that when thinking about how to improve outcomes. And so running alongside the clinical skills training, we've also got to consider non-clinical skills such as quality improvement and implementation science. And Interference has hold, held an, in, an implementation science workshop uh, last year, which was attended by 
uh, many participants uh, internationally and we've had a 15 month uh, quality improvement program running for nurses in Ethiopia and Malawi who have produced some really excellent quality improvement pro um, projects which hopefully will be prevent presented at upcoming conferences. Research and data collection is absolutely crucial to Im uh, improvement. And I just want to give as one example, this uh, recent paper in the BMJ Open, which has been a participatory community survey of Burns uh, in Nepal. And in-depth questionnaires were carried out by house to house um, discussions in certain villages, not only to look at incidents of burn injury, but to find out what people do and what actions happen after a burn has been sustained. And by working closely with uh, the, the people in the village and the community in association with our basic burn care course, we've been able to show that we can reduce the incidence of burns in those villages. And as I said before, uh, not everything is within our sphere of influence as individuals uh, and even as services. So it's important that we act as advocates and that we work with our government and with other agencies to uh, put Burns on national agendas. And Interburns has been doing this, working with governments in various countries to help set up national strategies. So in summary, um, it's been a quick run through, but what we've shown is that improving burn outcomes does require a comprehensive and integrated systems approach. And Interburns has a proven framework for this and has shown success in capacity building in pilot services by using standards and evaluation tools and a comprehensive education portfolio, but running alongside also uh, quality improvement and implementation science and prevention research. And it's something that we can all contribute to. So I'm hoping that everyone listens to um, the talks in our webinar today. We can think about how we ourselves might put these things into practice in our own uh, environments, but that we can also think about how we can contribute to the wider picture. And I'd just like to refer you to um, the paper in the BMJ, which is uh, just published on quality improvement and capacity building in burn care and prevention uh, in LMICs, and also invite you to the Interburns webinar series starting in September 2020. And thank you so much uh, for listening um, today. Thank you, Sean. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our presentations. Um, we have a little time to um, do a summary of all that we've had, and you agree with me that it's been quite quite a lot. Uh, starting with Nadim, I mean Naim, uh, who presented a global view. Um, you will have seen that a number of issues record in the various presentations. And I know a number of you are also practicing in low and middle income who appreciated the same problems because a number of the questions uh, from the, in the Q and A have, uh, have uh, pointed at this. But one thing is obvious that these accidents are preventable. It's always said burn injuries are preventable. And it therefore means that in all the centers, in all the places, whether in Africa or Southeast Asia, even in the high income countries who have worked out a, um, a very elaborate preventive measures, that this is key to controlling the number of patients that will subsequently get to hospital and then um, subsequently reduce the, the amount of uh, people who will compete for available resources. So we need to look at prevention in the low and middle income countries where many of us work. Are there things we can do to help ameliorate this? And talking of prevention, it's tied up also to born education. A lot of the people in the places where we've been to, in the places where uh, our people work are ignorant. So we, we need to invest in uh, patient education. Now, how we're going to do that 
I, I don't have the total answer for that, but that's something we need to look at. Uh, we've, we've all heard about cost of bond care, which is the same in most places, whether it's in Africa or Southeast Asia. We've talked about, we've seen the, the um, lack of specialist care. You know, some of the places in Africa, they don't have a surgeon, not to talk of a burn surgeon. And that is why um, some of the activities like what uh, um, Research Africa is doing, BFAS is doing, Interbans is doing, trying to raise uh, local uh, support in a contextual background. I think it's something we need to look at. Uh, all of us from the lower and middle income countries. Um, a number of questions have been raised. I think I'll, I'll just ask um, Orin to take uh, a few of these and um, we'll just wrap it up. I want to thank you all for listening. It's been a wonderful day and I'm sure we have a number of things that will be running through our minds which uh, we can begin to learn to address. Orin. Richard, thanks very much. Uh, it's been a wonderful meeting so far. It's fantastic to have so many people participate. I'd like to thank all the speakers and I'd like to pass on the fact that within the chat, uh, everybody has complimented each of the speakers. Um, so very positive response. There are a number of uh, question themes that are coming through. Um, a lot relating to prevention, which uh, Richard has just mentioned. Um, and then some other very specific questions. One question is whether there's any allograft bank in Africa, which I think is something I will pose to um, uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Kemi, in a moment. Um, and thank, thanks to Dr. Obadi from the Congo for that question. Another question to Dr. Sabapathy in a moment will be um, whether he injects antibiotics under burn eschgar and perhaps whether that influences uh, resistant organisms. And perhaps the, um, to each of the panelists, the following question, whether you use predictive scores, the Bow score, we've spoken about mortality in several, um, several talks. Nikki said that very few people died in her experience, but because smaller burn injuries, uh, but I'd be very interested to see how people approach a major burn where they feel it may not be survivable. So perhaps uh, since Kemi spoke first, I'll ask you, Kemi, um, is there an allograph bank in Nigeria and are you aware of one in Africa? Thanks, Oran. I'm not aware of any. At least I know for Nigeria, we do not have a skin bank and I would imagine there will be some resistance to people donating their organs, especially their skin after their death. So I'm not aware of any that we have so far. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm aware that there is a skin bank, there are skin banks in hospitals in uh, South Africa, um, in the Chris Hanna Baragwanath and in a few other hospitals, they have skin banks. There, there, there are um, one or two centers that have tried to develop uh, independent skin banks, but um, uh, I think in South Africa they are. Uh, I might move on to the next question that we got, which is for Dr. Sabapathy. Um, hopefully you've not heard the question. And, uh, um, do you use so antibiotics under burns? And um, also, how do you predict survivability? And does that influence your decision to treat? Yes, sir. So I'm not aware of anyone injecting antibiotics uh, underneath the burn scars in, in not only in my uh, throat, India. Um, I think the, the, the main problem is that a lot of times they're not excised and then they become infected, the deep burns become infected and then the sepsis and things go on. I think that is the main problem. I, I don't think we, uh, I, I don't think any unit injects antibiotics uh, within the burn is scars anywhere. So that's a but, but I think the main reason is that uh, a lot of people uh, give a lot of uh, antibiotics indiscriminately which has contributed to a lot of uh, antibiotic resistance. So even if we get a small, even if we get one infection, we get a multi-drug resistant organism. I think that has been a big challenge for us. I think that is one of the big challenge. Going on to the question on how do we predict the mortality? It is something like the um, box score. We use the age and we use the total body surface area. We take into account the comorbidities 
and then uh, we uh, take into account whether the patient will be able to pay for uh, for what he's able to do as well and the other thing is that we also look into how much percentage of the wound is superficial and how much percentage is deep in if it's 60% and if it's 60% superficial with skulls i think it's going to have a much better percentage of living rather than the 30% fully deep with deep scar or deep scars so i think i will be taking all this into account and then we speak to the patient and then uh, the attenders and then we uh, we go on to know whether we can go to the full extent of treating the patient really well or not thank you very much raja for your insights there I'd like also to address that question to uh, Professor Tariq Iqbal. He's spoken of his experience with 146,000 patients with burn injury. Uh, so he obviously has a huge experience. Um, uh, Professor Iqbal, could you uh, tell us your thoughts on, with uh, such a huge number of burns every year, obviously a huge burden on service, um, do you use scoring systems to determine who's more likely to survive? And how do you approach uh, that problem of yes. someone yes, Thank you very much. Yes, we are using this box score and with a little bit of uh, local modification. And, uh, and this we need for, uh, especially for those patients who are above 60 to 70% burn. And we are receiving a lot of them uh, here. Uh, the main problem with us over here is the delay in presentation because these patients, they first go to their uh, nearby hospitals and from there, as I uh, discussed in my presentation, that they've been, uh, they, 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 those hospitals are not resuscitating them and they're not providing them the emergency uh, treatment and they keep on referring all those patients to the specialized burn center and that's how the the precious time that, that was uh, lost and uh, that add up to these uh, scores and add up to the mortality. Thank you very much uh, for that insight. I see uh, as some comments coming in. One is whether there's a, a confirming the fact that there is a skin bank in South Africa as uh, Professor Nabucco has just uh, told us. Um, the questions about painkillers and burn patients, we think we'll potentially uh, defer to the following session where we will have a talk from uh, Mike Basler, who will discuss further pain. A question whether the occupational therapists are uh, included with a therapist in general. Uh, Sean, you've been um, to many different parts of the world. Uh, do, uh, does the specialty of occupational therapy exist um, separate from or just generic to therapy? Um, it does seem to be quite variable. So uh, in my experience, it's rare for there to be separate occupational therapy. And in many um, sort of uh, intermediate type of facilities, there is very limited physiotherapy. And I think one of the things that um, is important to think about is that uh, in high income countries, we're very role specific and we think very much about uh, which part of the uh, patient's care is being offered by which particular specialty. But in fact, uh, in many resource poor places, many of those tasks need to be shared amongst the available people, which includes also the patient's family. And so it's less important to have an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist and more important that everybody knows what needs to be done in terms of rehabilitation for the patient. Super. Thank you very much, Anna. One last question to Nikki. Um, can you tell me of any, um, you mentioned prevention and the fact that you have got perhaps a different distribution of uh, patient ages and profiles. Uh, do you know of any effective measures that you've seen in Zanzibar or in, um, in Tanzania that have helped um, change the patients who are burn injured? Uh, 
So that's a really good question. I think that um, it's it's not necessarily even about different strategies. It's how those strategies are communicated across the communities. Um, our experience working with HIPS is actually using radio uh, talks and allowing people to phone in and actually have discussions and open that up to the communities is an incredibly effective way. Um, getting in at schools as well and educating the children so that learning happens at a very young age and then is shared amongst the family and among children. I think are very much strategies that have been used and have been very, very effective. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mickey. And uh, with that, with Richard, uh, we'd like to thank you so much for uh, this session. It's been just amazing. Um, wonderful to hear the experiences of uh, so many experienced clinicians and indeed uh, the president of uh, ISBI, emphasizing the need for a um, need to reflect on, on burn injury to uh, collect data as a means to um, determine how best to achieve improvements in patient care. So thank you all very much. It's been most interesting chairing with someone in a different continent and uh, having people speak from many other places. Thank you very much. It's time for a tea break, a uh, comfort break, and we will see you back at um, uh, in five to six minutes time. Suggest so perhaps um, a little early at uh, 15.33. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Oren. Thanks, everybody. So, um, yeah, we'll have a five-minute break, and uh, if you can be back just before 3.35, uh, that'd be great, and we'll start off with some more polling again for the next session. Uh, so, thanks, everybody. Um, <laughs>
Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Burn Symposium. My name is Matt Fell. I'm a trainee of plastic surgery and uh, burns in the UK. And it's a great honor to introduce the chairs for session two today. There are two chairs. The first, Professor Naeem Moyman, who is the current president of the International Association of Burn Injury, the ISBI, and the past president of the European Burn Association, the EBA, and the British Burn Association, the BBA. He is also director of the Scar Free Centre for Conflict Wound Research in Birmingham. Our second chair, Professor Murzam Tarar, is the founder executive director of one of the largest burn and plastic surgery centres in Pakistan and current president of the Pakistan Burn Association. He is a recipient of Sitara M. Imtiaz, one of the country's highest civil awards for his services in the field of burn care and reconstructive surgery. I hand you over to the chairs of session two. Thanks, Matt. And uh, it's a great pleasure to, um, to work with uh, Mozim Tarar. We've been working together. We, we trained together in the old days, maybe um, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, in England, and there was, um, he's a great colleague and friend. So, Mozam, please start. Can you hear me, Mozam? And Naim, will you read out the polling questions? I can't see it, sorry. Okay. This was the first question. It's okay, I can do that in the meantime. Yep. So the first question is, um, how soon after the burn injury do you usually, usually see most patients in your hospital? Um, so most of them, it will vary a lot. So within 48 hours, two to seven days, one to three weeks, or later than three weeks. Just generally speaking, how uh, soon after the burn injury are you usually seeing? Uh, most of your patients in your hospital. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll just give that another few moments to uh, to let everybody uh, get a feel for that. I think uh, about half the people have uh, voted so far. We have the results up on the screen, Nadim. Yep, go for it, Oren. Yep. Uh, so the majority of people, eighty-four percent, are saying they. Uh, are seeing burn patients within 48 hours, um, with uh, only 3% seeing between one to three weeks and only 1% later than three weeks. So most people are seeing people with a burn injury quite early. All right, and we've got the second question. So the second question is, how soon after the burn injury do you usually excise and graft after they present to your hospital? So once they're in the hospital, how soon after, if they need surgery, for the ones who need it, how soon afterwards are you excising and grafting? Within 48 hours, two to seven days, one to three weeks, or late in three weeks. So this is for surgery. Uh, Emma, is that poll open? I'm not sure if people can vote at the moment. It is open, about half, half the delegates are voting. Oh, I can't see at the moment. They're all coming through. I'm going to put it live now. Perfect. Naeem, can you see that? Yes, I can. Yeah, perfect. Do you want to talk about that then and then I'll let you take that back? So, uh, in this one, there is 24 uh, 14 percent they can uh, they, they do that within the first 48 hours and uh, the majority really um, uh, it's between two and seven days there is a uh, 10 percent however uh, that really happens after three weeks so should we go for name, uh, name I'm back on yeah, thank you can you Mozart. hear me 
Yeah, I can hear you very well. Yes. So, thank you very much, Nadim, and thank you, Nain, for uh, standing in my place for a few minutes while we were doing the poll. So, with the permission of the chair, uh, should we uh, start with the first speaker? Uh, yes, please. Nain. Yes. Our first speaker uh, for this session is Mr. Apoko. M. Poma from Accra, Ghana. He's a consultant plastic surgeon in Accra, Ghana, and he's the director of Research Africa, president of the Ghana Burn Association, and an executive member of Pan African Burn Society. He's a member of Interburns and honorary medical director for Ghana Foundation of Operation Smile. He's going to talk about role of surgeons in acute burn care. Apoku, over to you please. Hello everyone, it's a privilege to be in such a great company. And uh, thanks for the invitation to be part of this important workshop. Uh, I'll be discussing acute surgery and the uh, role of surgery in BNK. First of all, we have to start with an assessment of the patient. What was the cause of the burn and the timing of the burn? and uh, whether the patient is presented to us early or late, as tends to be the case in most low and middle income countries. Now, what kind of first aid was given to the patient is important because as was alluded to by an earlier speaker, many of the patients tend to receive inappropriate first aid, which tends to complicate their management. We also have to rule out inhalation injury, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides down. The size of the pen is also very important because it helps us to determine the extent of injury and also helps us to be able to envisage what kind of clinical course that this is going to take and whether the patient needs to be admitted or not. The site of the burn is also relevant because we need burns of sensitive places like the face, the hands, the feet, joints, perineum, et cetera, have, uh, uh, tend to be more complicated and require more specialist attention. The depth of the burn also needs to be assessed. And this can sometimes be tricky because of uh, other previous inappropriate phase that was given or the timing of presentation. Sometimes it, it muddies the water and we cannot see uh, clearly what uh, happened. Now, the size of the pen is usually assessed by either the rule of nines, uh, which is uh, commonly known and it tends to divide the body into proportions, which are factors of nine or multiples of nine thereof. And, uh, this is very simple, but it tends to be inaccurate. So the land and powder chart is used, uh, with, uh, which is more appropriate for children and gives a more accurate assessment. That's what's on the right. Now for the depth of the burn, uh, we generally appreciate that burns that involve the epidermis or the upper part of the dermis, as you can see on the slide, um, are burns that usually without any complication will tend to heal uh, within two to three weeks maximum. But when you have deeper bends involving the deep dermis or the full thickness of the skin, then this will result in delayed healing and would sometimes, most of the time, will require a surgical intervention to, for optimum healing. Uh, children elderly tend to have deeper bends, even with the same level of insult because we have a thinner skin. And uh, one should also keep re-evaluating these bends because the bends can deepen uh, or change within the uh, first few days, really where there's poor resuscitation or where infection sets in. Bends of the palms and soles and the back and the scalp, generally because the skin there is thicker, uh, they tend to do better generally and uh, respond more to conservative measures. Now, the history of the the patient asking, what is the patient? Is there, is there a cough? Are they asking for breath? Are they uh, in the mouth? Are they just freezing and all? Or, I mean, there are various other signs that uh, can give 
uh, an indication that there's a Haitian injury and the anesthetist should be involved in the management. And uh, the surgical procedure will tell you for patients at scarotomy, fasciotomy, the more and amputation, and then uh, but for the purpose of this, I'm going to consider the first four. A scrotomy involves or incision into the um, uh, the thick scar. That's where the bent skin uh, gets denatured and elastic and can cause compression of underlying tissues and impair circulation. If this is not addressed, it can cause circulatory compromise and gangrene can result. So it's important to establish this early on and monitor the appropriate and intervene uh, as, as appropriate. And so um, you can see it's like, you can see a patient with, you can see the tip of the fingers are quite dusky, poor capillary refill, et cetera. And you can, so this is a patient who needs a scarotomy. Now the, the scarotomy generally tends to be undertaken along these lines and the deeper, uh, uh, you know, lines or the border areas are as well as to uh, watch out for uh, superficial structures which can be damaged if one goes to the examples of a scarotomy uh, and uh, scarotomies can be complicated by you know excessive blood loss and then one goes to the, one can do an inadvertent shot which can expose an aligned structures it's also the problem of dealing with the scarotomy wound afterwards now fasciotomies are indicated when when one has it's filled with electrical bends and bends with crash injury. Now, bends with uh, electrical bends tend to cause damage to electroporin and then uh, cause of the, uh, the heat damage to resistance of tissues. This causes deep, deep bends than is clinically evident. And so it's important anybody history of electrical bends, one shouldn't just be in a hurry to discharge them, but monitor them closely and uh, uh, intervene. And so the cardinal symptom for uh, companions, you know, is pain. Pain which is out of proportion to you, pain which is refractory to analgesia and pain on passive stretches in space. Paresthesia also tends to be, but the other signs like hostlessness and, uh, you know, for uh, example, that's when the, uh, the limb feels cold, etc., are very, very late signs, so it should not be relied on. So once there's a suspicion of this kind of injury, it's best to intervene and to wait. And so these are, this picture below shows you what the arrow and shows you a patient with electrical uh, industry worker who had a high tension. You can see the swelling of the limb shorter. So high index of suspicion is important, adequate monitoring and prompt action, and then involve the physiotherapist for optimum results. Sometimes tissues are so damaged that they cannot be salvaged. Like you can see in this hand, which also was as a result of high tension electrical volt, uh, voltage, uh, high tension voltage injury. And so this, um, uh, you know, requires amputation. And it's important that this is discussed ab initio because sometimes in trying to salvage the limb, you may end up uh, uh, causing release of toxins to a circulation. This can cause renal damage and other, uh, uh, and actually worsen the clinical cause of the patient. So it's important to do a good assessment, you can call a colleague to assist you if you are not sure, and then uh, the decision should be taken and the uh, patient should be cancelled and the amputation should be done. And the level of amputation depends on the extent of injury, and this should be discussed with the patient. And it's also important to consider secondary closure, as sometimes the extent of the damage may not be immediately apparent. And also in, in, in situations where there is focal tissue damage, there may be a need to divide specific, specific areas and uh, where appropriate early grafting can be undertaken. Uh, now, in treating the bend, especially bends that are deep derma or full thickness bends, uh, it's important uh, to, for the bends to be excised because bend wound is a focus for sepsis and most uh, deep bends, if not treated, will result in poor, uh, uh, in poor scars and then contractures with the attendant uh, problems for the patient in terms of uh, livelihood and psych uh, psychologically. But this needs to be done carefully. The aims of early surgery, uh, as has been espoused by people like Jan Sekovic, who popularized this technique, is to reduce the healing time, reduce infections, uh, reduce the hospital stay, and then uh, also the 
get a better quality of scar and uh, you know improve the quality of life of the patient generally. And of course, patients must be stabilized uh, before this is undertaken. And one must ensure that there's adequately available donor sites to do this. Now, the types of excision can be two. There's, you can do a tangential excision where you're taking tissue, slices of tissue to come to healthy tissue and then uh, can perform the graft either immediately or within the next 24, 48 hours after adequate hemostasis. So there's a uh, water knife that can be used to uh, undertake uh, the tangential excision. The advantage is that it can be performed quickly and uh, it gives optimum functional and cosmetic results, but there's also a risk of blood loss and it takes a bit of experience to be able to do this properly. Now, the excision to fascia is another option and this involves take a uh, section of it down to the fascia. And this can also be done quickly because the, the, end, the end point uh, is, is known. But then uh, the disadvantages are that there's a risk of exposure of nerves, lymphatics, and, and tendons. And also, cosmetically, it's less acceptable. Of course, the donor side uh, for grafts, you are, usually will take what, what is available and consider color match and reuse if necessary. Um, the uh, Hamby knife uh, is not available in most places, but most uh, centers have the water knife, which is handy. Grafts can be meshed also to allow for expansion and better drainage, but of course they have poorer cosmetic effects. Grafts can fail from hematoma, seroma, sharing, infection, and uh, inappropriate CPN sites. And also the donors can also get complicated abnormal scarring and delayed healing. Um, there are the other techniques uh, which allow for grafting in very large areas of um, Bend, or very large bends or very large areas of skin loss, but uh, like knee graft, in low graft, integral, etc. But these are generally not available in the low and middle income countries. So um, the barriers to surgery, um, early surgery, although the advantages are known, are because of delayed presentation, also the issues with blood loss and availability of blood, and then more importantly, uh, adequately trained personnel and logistics. Uh, you know, like anesthetists and, uh, and also uh, healthcare financing issues are, are, are things that are, are a problem in low and middle income countries. And generally, we tend to measure our success in low and middle income countries by, uh, you know, what percentage of pain survive. But I think it's time to look at what quality of survival that our patients are getting because there are many times of patients with 40, 50 percent pain survive, but then and they have contractors and they are not uh, able to undertake normal activities of daily living. So we need to, um, it's time to look at the quality of life. So of course, this has to be situated within the context of the local situation, what expertise is available and what um, a, a, a treatment a, a can be a, a given. But then um, uh, we also need to look within our context to find out when is treatment future. Because, uh, and this is something that also has to be situated within the local context, because even within countries, uh, centers can differ, differ, differ widely with respect to uh, availability of uh, manpower, availability of logistics, etc. Et and then what kind of socioeconomic brackets of people tend to uh, patronize a particular institution. So this has to be discussed within a local context. But then the important thing is that even when it is future, we have to treat the patients with dignity. And it's important that uh, for those of us involved in bank care in the low and middle income countries, we have to learn to be extra resourceful so that uh, if you don't have a physiotherapist, we, in the time person we didn't have a physiotherapist, we, tr we trained healthcare assistants to provide some level of physiotherapy so physiotherapists became available. Same thing for um, psychological support or other, uh, uh, you know, and of course, in many centers where they are not trained surgeons, medical officers can be trained to do some limited amount of work in terms of uh, uh, pain, uh, excision, and scarotomy, depriving pains, and doing basic skin grafting. And uh, I have this saying that when the ideal is not available, the available becomes ideal. And it's important also not to let what we cannot do interfere with what uh, we can do. Because many times we focus on the big problems, but then there are little things that we can do. So it's important for us to be able to do the simple things well uh, about uh, resuscitation, debriding, rehabilitation, um, and, you, know, uh, uh, you know, doing the, the things that are within our means uh, and that, uh, we can just, uh, so that we can give optimum uh, care for the patient and then still keep pushing for better resources and better facilities.
And so I'd like to, at this point, like to acknowledge Mr. Watson, Dr. Keswani, and Research and Tapens for their support in my work. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Aboko. Thanks for a very comprehensive review of um, the, the surgical perspective of um, uh, looking after acute burns. And um, it's really high quality care that you are, um, you are providing to your patients um, in, um, in Ghana. Um, there are fewer questions from the audience, but we'll do this later on. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, in, invite Dr. Mike Bessler. He's a consultant anesthetist and pain medicine in Glasgow, in the United Kingdom. He is previous member of the British Pain Society Council and has been involved in burn training in Accra, Ghana, and also with Research Africa. So, Mike, please. I, thank you. Apoko, can you come off your screen share, please, so I can get on? Hi Nadim, when I'm trying to share the screen, uh, there still seems to be a Poco's talk. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'll try. You know, take Thank a you. Second or two. Should be okay. Thank you. Should be okay now. Right. That's great. Let's have a look. Okay. Hopefully that's me. Hi there. Uh, thanks very much for uh, asking me to speak. And I just want to thank, apart from BFOS and BAPRAS, uh, obviously, and the British Burns Association, Research Africa. I'm a consultant anaesthetist who has an interest in burns management, and I've also been to Ghana to work with Mr. Ampoma, who's got an excellent service. Uh, so I'm going to really talk about two things, but slides before that... Your slides hello? come up at the moment. I, I can't see slides. Are you sharing your screen? I hope so. Hold on a second. Just check. Just check. You maybe. I'll check with everybody else. Right, let me just get out of escape, hold on. Uh, come on, end show, right, uh, share screen. Uh, so I'm still on the Deem, how about that? Let me try that. Is that no, me now? That's good, that's good. Yep. Apologies for that, that was it's my fault. The there you go. Okay, go. Well, thank you, sorry about that. So, we'll, so first of all, as I say, I'd like to thank Research Africa and a variety of other organisations. Now, before we start, I want to uh, look at this initial quote at the top. And really, what I want to do is encourage people in low and middle income countries, because actually, I don't know if I could achieve what all of these people and all of you are doing with the resources that you have. And sometimes I've been at sessions and, and seminars where people put up all the amazing things that are being done in high income countries. But actually, you know, the real challenge, and the real skill are people in middle income countries who with very little can do an awful lot and it can be life changing. And really a surgeon or anyone that's interested in burn care is like a diamond in a lower middle income country because with simple things you can make enormous changes. Now my talk's going to be about two things. The first thing is really just about the teamwork and the multidisciplinary team and then secondly I'm going to quickly focus on anesthesia and go through what I think are some of the key issues. So if we just get a laser pointer up here. Now this is sports and sports have lots of teams and this guy's a quarterback. Now not is he a great athlete, he's very, very clever intellectually and he's worth millions of dollars. But if we imagine that, for example, this is hemorrhage, this is infection, this is poor nutrition, and this is poor monitoring of a post-op patient. And these are the anaesthetists and the surgical sister and the therapist and the nurses in the ward then if they don't do their job properly, this guy will be useless. And actually, that's what actually happened with this particular individual. He was a very good uh, athlete, but that particular team had a bunch of people who were rubbish here. And when that happened, he was unable to complete or do whatever he does. And so this is the surgeon and this is the team. And one of the things about this particular sport is before they do anything, they all meet together. They all discuss things and the leader who is the quarterback or will tell exactly what they need to do and what their jobs require. And so that to me, sports is a very good model to think about how you should make your multidisciplinary team work. Okay. Now, is there a problem? There's a fantastic study by a professor called Bruce Bickard in South Africa who did the African Surgical Outcome Study, and he looked at 14,700 operations in 25 nations, only over a short period of time. 
And he showed that one of them, five of them had a post-operative complication. One in 10 of them would die. And these were healthy people. And 95% of them died of a post-operative complication and 6% that occurred on day one. So that begins to tell me that in some centers, perioperative care is a huge issue, not just preoperative resuscitation, but when we get the patients to the hospital. Koga, a, a Brazilian surgeon, did a systematic review and showed that in low and middle income countries, approximately 20% of patients can have a perioperative cardiac arrest. And it was interesting that uh, Professor Moen spoke about the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, because it's actually a Lancet Commission on Global Surgery and Anesthesia. And it actually probably should be the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery and Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And uh, from the World Journal of Surgery, it was shown in 2015, anesthesia in an editorial was considered to be the rate limiting step for improvements. Now, th this is me with some of the anesthetists in Ghana. This man is a doctor, but these are nurse anesthetists who've done 12 to 18 months uh, training. Now, they are exceptional individuals, but actually they are limited. They come with their own equipment, which is not standardized. They may have variable drugs. And this person who is at the top end of, of the, what might be a long and difficult case will maybe not have the same degree of medical education or status or, or money than say the surgeon that's involved. Now, there's some things that we can change, but we certainly can't change the, uh, we certainly can, can't, there's some things we can't change, sorry, such as their pay and the, and the way things are run, but we can change the status we give them within the realms of our burn organization, just like we can look at the physiotherapist and also the nutritionist, etc. Now, how do we make change? All anesthetists talk about the saturation probe. And I was interested to see that Sean's talk had an almost similar curve about the progress in burns. And if we know about saturation, what we know is it's almost like a cliff. As your oxygen goes down, your oxygen saturation and delivery to the tissues goes down precipitously. And if you look at burn care right now in the developing world, we're kind of up here. And that's why we are talking about morbidity because we're putting an awful lot of effort to try and deal with mortality, but actually it doesn't really change. But in low and middle income countries for very simple measures, we can have great, great changes in the outcomes in both morbidity and mortality. Now this man is called David Brailsford. And he was the head of the British cycle team who were terrible. They never won anything. And what he did was he instituted a program of what he called marginal gains, which essentially means lots of little small things. And what they did was they changed the tires on them, they changed the helmet, but he also did clever things. He got them all to wash their hands and soap to prevent infections, which showed that they could train longer. And when he did all this, 10 years later, the British cycle team had over 20 gold medals in two Olympics, just by taking small, little things regularly. Now, a long time ago, I asked a man, but what was the most important thing in world development? And he told me the Toyota Hilux van, because it's indestructible and it always works. He told me the mobile phone is really important for development and the internet, because both of them can spread knowledge and education and communication. Now, Toyota have a system which they call lean. And what do they do? They look at any process and they say, if I'm doing something that's futile, I shouldn't do it. Now, when I go to a ward and someone says, I ask, why are we doing measuring this or taking that? And they say, because we've always do done this. Then the first thing that comes to my head is, is this a futile task? And the reason I, I think that is because it's taking space and time and a limited resource. I may also ask, is it an uneven task? For example, we don't send the patients back to this ward because they always get infections. That be the cleaner that's involved in the ward. It might not be the surgeon, it might be the nurses, but what we want to do is make sure that all of our wards adhere to the same standard. And this is obviously what happens in low and middle income countries, which is you have too heavy a burden and you get overwhelmed. With COVID, which we'll talk about later, that happened recently to a lot of services in the UK. And what you need to do 
is you need to learn and have systems that delegate appropriately. So these diamonds, these surgeons, these anaesthetists are seeing the appropriate patients rather than wasting their time on patients who are well. And I like this quote, which be success can be a few simple disciplines practiced every day, but failure can be repeated errors of judgment, a few of them repeated every day. Okay, now let's just look at this. This is a theatre from a, a picture that I've got from a friend who was in Sierra Leone. This lady's probably filling out the WHO checklist, but there's nobody there. We don't know about this child's airway. We don't know about the monitoring, but this could be a badly burned child with a scar contraction. And when this anaesthetist has only got her own gear comes in and fails to intubate the patient and desaturates, you can imagine that there'll be lots of people running in. Everyone will be shouting rather than it being planned. This was from a paper about hernias, and you can see that these have been done under spinal anesthesia. There's no monitoring, and we don't know where anyone is, and probably infection control can be looked at as well. A simple thing like a sharps box may be used, but if the head sister in the theater suite, because of this particular sharps box, gets a needle stick injury and doesn't come back to work, then a key part of your team might go missing, could even be your surgeon. Now you might not be able to deal with the fact that the power and the water goes down, but you can have protocols to deal with that. What do we do? You can rehearse these things. So let's move on to anesthesia. Now there are two main issues in anesthesia with burns. The first is the acute burn, which we're talking about today. And then is obviously there are reconstructive issues. And the key issue is with the acute burn, which I'll talk about, you assess, how the burn happened, but also the clinical signs in the patient. So is it in an enclosed room? Was there a large burn? Is the patient unconscious? And one of the things that I do is I often try and ask to see a photograph of the patient on their mobile phone, because usually they exist. That way I get an idea that if this man's face, and these pictures are from Google on the internet, are, is a swollen here and I can see a difference, then their epiglottis might be swollen as well their upper airway, the supraglottic airway, and I'm going to be prepared for trouble, okay? If we look at the other type of airway issue, it'll be things like contractures in the neck, and also this person's got a, a retracted jaw, and they've also got some, that's a tissue expander. So these kind of things can, will need me to make myself and my anaesthetist prepared. But what do we know? Well, we know that your anaesthetist might not be the same one every week. They might not have much in the way of training and experience, and you won't have any structured systems in place. So airway issues are common in both acute and non-acute. And if I could ask for every burn surgeon to do something about airway, I would say that you should have a difficult airway trolley with all of the things in there. Now, what we know is that maybe these, these uh, bits of medical equipment might go missing. But what I would say is if you made sure that it was stocked and every time something went missing, it was taken from the senior consultant anaesthetist paycheck and the surgeon's paycheck, then we might find that, that won't, the stuff won't be stolen. So we've said enclosed space, we've said facial burns, large burn, inhalational injury. We've talked about upper via lower burns. Now, obviously with steam, you may also get lower burn injuries and therefore they may desaturate much more quickly. But the key is to have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. If we look, we did a, an audit and many of the problems of an airway still occurred, but this is with nurse anaesthetists in the local vicinity around Ghana aspiration and death, failed ventilation and death and failed intubation. Now, this is a very simple thing that can provide a surgical airway. It's not expensive, it's called a gum elastic bougie, that's a size six and a half tube and that's a scalpel. And we taught people that if they got into severe trouble, what, this is what they do. They make a cricothyroidotomy, they stick this down and then they railroad the tube over it. I did this case with one of the surgeons who's speaking on the second day in Mr. Ampoma, uh, the second uh, seminar, sorry, and this is a woman with a very difficult area due to NOMA. And what we did was we had a plan, we had a plan A, a plan B and a plan C, and the surgeons were here in theatre. We all knew what our tasks were. So that's the important thing. If I was to talk about purchases, well, I maybe might say to you, if you really want to make a difference for your anaesthetic department, don't buy them a hugely expensive anaesthetic machine buy them this, which is what's called a video laryngoscope. And that will make many of their difficult airways easy. If we talk about breathing, like has been mentioned earlier on from uh, Nigeria, 
The ITU provision, for example, in Bangladesh is 0.3 ICU beds for 100,000 patients, whereas in the USA and Europe, it's much greater than that. So it's much more difficult. So you're going to have to decide, am I going to intubate this patient? Because the reality is you've got to do something about it. If they've got a facial burn, that the swelling might be down and they, they look like they might survive, that might be a useful thing. But if they've got large burns and their bulk scores high, you have to decide, okay? And it's difficult. So they will come in with a high metabolic rate and if you've got oxygen, they will need it. What we know with inhalational injuries is that your saturation probe might not give you an accurate reading because of carboxyhemoglobin. But if we give them 100% oxygen with a rebreathing mask, then the curve and the, the, the uh, elimination of carbon monoxide increases and, and uh, we can help them out. What we also know is that there are kits like the cyano kit where we can give them hydroxycobalamin if, if cyanide poisoning is an issue. And for some things we will do a bronchoscopy to stage what uh, level we think their burners and remove some of the debris. But essentially when we ventilate them, because I was asked to talk about this, we're wanting to prevent secondary damage. And we do that by limiting their airway pressures and using PEEP and a low volume, high rate, ventilatory strategy and we look for secondary care. But if I was to ask you where you should put your resources, I would be saying blood pressure kit, I would be saying a saturation probe which is very cheap and this thing called a news chart. I would remind you uh, from the graph that Sean said that sent uh, many of the advances in burn care and the amazing things that were done were done with people who had simple instruments but they had effective and rigorous processes. So this is a news chart. And remember I said to you, you want to be able to delegate when you're overloaded. If we look up here, this is the respiratory rate. This is the saturation scale. This is the blood pressure, the pulse. And if I could say to anyone and everyone here, if you implement this in your high dependency area, your high care area, this will save you work. Because when you put this chart up and the nurses know this, you can then get a score. And when you aggregate the score, you get an idea of who's the sickest patient. Remember, we had the saturation probe and we want to prevent them falling off that hill. We want to prevent them falling down. Now, this is a very easy thing to do, but what it also does is it frees up the surgeon to say, I'm going to see my post-operative patients, and I'm also going to see the bad patients with the MU scores, but all the people with good MU scores, I'm going to let the junior doctor see, rather than seeing everyone else. Okay, so if we talk about circulation, clearly, Patients often come in late and they will be underfilled and we will use the Parkland formula. I put a reference to it, I'm sure you all know it. What I would suggest is, as has been said before, there is lots and lots of good apps that you can download on your phone that help you to understand the fluids. Roughly in the next 24 hours, we will use inotropes and fluids. Now the inotrope we use is noradrenaline and it's often very difficult to get pumps. What I would suggest is you could dilute the noradrenaline. We usually use 100 mics per mil, but imagine we made it 10 mics per mil. We run from three to five mils an hour. So we could use a pediatric giving set as long as we were monitoring this very closely to run 30 mils an hour. I worked with great pediatric consultants that did that. We put in a urinary catheter and 0.5 mil for kids, uh, sorry, uh, one to two mil an, an hour for kids and 0.5 mil for adults. But the most important thing is to start to think about a thing called fluid creep, which actually means that we tend to over time give too much fluids. And we've been looking at that. And that's more common in patients who maybe get high dose opioids. Now, in lower middle income countries, you're, I would imagine you're going to have to err on the side of fluids rather than not, but it's just something to think about. One of the other things that was shown in that study about a uh, surgical outcome was that very many of the patients that came back for elective surgery, not just emergency surgery, were anemic. And often you will have little access to blood. Now, I would suggest that all the patients that you see in your clinics should be getting multivitamins and iron before they come to the surgery. But the most important thing is that we talk to each other over the theater table, that the surgeon tells the anesthetist the patient's bleeding a lot, particularly if it's a child. Okay, there's a little bit uh, about disability. Mike, about, sorry, Mike, we've got about a minute. Yeah, okay, there's a little thing for disability, okay? So temperature, uh, uh, you need to keep them so, and I'm gonna quickly talk about analgesia, okay? Now what we use is an oral morphine protocol. The oral morphine protocol is a, 
Oromorph, and key to it is the MUSE score. For dressing changes, we will use ketamine, a, a tamazepam or a benzodiazepine, an opiate and paracetamol. Now you can give these orally, which makes them cheaper before you come, as long as you're monitoring them. For children, you can consider nasal diamorphine and ketamine. And again, I've put references in it. And one of the key things I want to talk about is tumescent or regional anesthesia, which is actually a cost save. Finally, I want to talk about everything else. Now, when you make these changes, a minimum amount of thought shouldn't go into a maximum amount of change. Change incrementally and don't just try and run about and do everything. One of the key issues is that if you use decibels and shout at people, sometimes it's not particularly good and you need to look that the changes that you make are financially really viable for your organisation and people because if they don't, they won't go through and all team members and skills and abilities to fix problems. I was going to act, talk about Dr. James McEwen-Smith, who is an amazing physician who came to Glasgow, but I'm going to leave it at that right now. So what we'll talk about is there's some useful resources. Cobus is a Scottish burns resource online. You can look at the Russell Hall Hospital Burn Injury Guide. It's very easy to download. There's lots of resources for drugs, uh, and uh, the Difficult Airways Society has lots of great videos to deal with things. I've put up a whole bunch of uh, references that I think will be useful if you want to look at it. I would currently say that the ABC of Burns is a great place to start. And these are some of the things about analgesia. And I'm talking again later on about analgesia. I hope that's enough. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mike. That was very illuminating. Uh, and now we move on to nursing. And it's my pleasure to invite Mrs. Nicole Lee, She's from Chelmsford, UK. Mike, have you, has, Mike, have you finished on sharing your screen, by the way? Sorry. Yeah, I want, yeah, could you take it away? That's great. Sorry. Nadim, just... do you want me to yeah, call the next one, please? Please, yeah, thanks. Sorry. Okay. Nadine, I'm no, just it's trying okay. to end, end my show. Right. While Mike is doing that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mrs. Nicole Lee. Uh, she was going to talk about nursing in acute burn care. She is from Chelmsford, UK, and has over 11 year experience in the Burn ITU as the senior sister and clinical trainer. She is the lead nurse for London and Southeast Burns Network, working with Research Africa on projects in Sierra Leone, and has a specialist interest in simulation training. Nicole, if you are ready, then. Uh, Hello, I'm Nicole Lee and I am a senior sister and clinical facilitator in a Burns Intensive Care Unit in St Andrew's Centre for Plastic Surgery in the UK. I'm also lead nurse for the London and South East Burns Network. I'm here today to talk to you about nursing in burn care. So what is the role of the nurse within burn care? I've added this article at the bottom, it's a new article out from America that shows that with good nursing numbers, Burns patients' mortality is reduced. So why might that be? Well, the nurses get to spend the most amount of time of the day with the patients. They get to see if the patient is improving or deteriorating and then can escalate that to the MDT. Because they get to spend so much time with the patient, they understand their wishes and look after their well-being. They tend to be the organisers of the ward. That means that they organise the MDT at different times of the day so everyone has their time with the patient to improve the patient's outcomes. I would argue they are the glue that stick the MDT together. I'm interested to see that there's not that many nurses that are logged on today to this conference. I wonder why that might be and actually I feel that the nurses role within different countries has expanded. A nursing assessment will look at what happened to the patient, how big was the wound, where does this patient need to be nursed, is that on a ward or in a home environment and actually if it is a home environment does this patient have any family to look after them? When did this injury happen and what does this patient need to heal? It might mean an array of dressings, it may mean that it needs surgery. Does this patient have money to actually pay for this treatment? And I think these are all really interesting points 
that we all face in different ways across the countries looking at burn care. A wound assessment will take place calculating total body surface area, looking at the burn wound depth of injury, is the wound superficial, partial, deep dermal or full thickness. This is otherwise known as first, second, third or fourth degree in other countries. The nurse is looking to see whether or not the wound is expected to heal within 14 days. If so, then they may consider cleaning, dressing and with good nursing care and patient education, these wounds can heal. If the wound is not expected to heal, it may end up a surgical wound bed following surgery. Considerations of whether or not it's been grafted or not may change our dressing strategies. If it's grafted, we may need to consider things like bulkier dressings to reduce friction and shearing to the wound bed where that new graft has been placed. If it's not been grafted, we may need to consider if skin substitutes have been used. If they have, some need to be kept clean and dry and others may need to have antimicrobials over the top. These will all be considered as part of the wound assessment. We all know that a burn wound on initial injury is sterilised under the heat of the injury. However, thereafter, the microorganisms from the skin will migrate into the wound bed or anything that might touch it. And actually some of the things we've talked about today is the fact we don't know how long after injury it could be weeks in some cases that before they turn up to our hospitals so contamination might be quite vast from a nurse's perspective this might need to be considered and actually what we might need to be doing is looking at an overall management strategy to reduce colonization of the skin around the wound this might mean some strategies around having patients wash in a certain decontamination agent in order to reduce that infection within the wound bed. There are many different antimicrobials available and I've attached some for reference on this slide. What we need to do is work out what we have local and available to us and use them effectively. I use hypochlorite as an example. I know that this has been used a lot over the last couple of years for decontamination of external surfaces with the outbreak of Ebola. However, it can be used within your patient's wound care, but it does need to be done in the right concentrations. I would suggest that you go back, have a look at what you've got and make strategies appropriate for different levels of use. This is just one of the examples. There are many different dressings on the market and actually it's not always the most expensive dressings that get you the best outcomes. Some of the simplest dressings will have the best outcomes. We think about that here in Chelmsford by looking at our infections. Spending some time teaching your staff if you don't have microbiology available to you on the look and the smell of the wound bed can be really useful in targeting them antimicrobials at the wound bed site. We use some of the things like vinegars, betadines, hypochlorite and honeys in order to improve our wound bed infections and actually by using them well you may well improve your outcomes. Spend some time teaching your nursing staff on how to see these infections early and target them can reduce systemic infections which in turn reduces the risks to your patients and mortality rates. The next important stage to consider is how you make your dressings. You'll see here on the left hand side of the slide, we use large dressing trolleys in order to create our dressings in a clean and sterile environment as possible. In the middle you'll see us making what we call a gelinette betadine pad. This is a common dressing for us to use and actually what we do is we use a gelinette which is our primary layer which is a non-stick and non-adherent layer which will be the first part that attaches to the wound bed. We then use a betadine soaked gauze for our antimicrobial and then we add a gamgee on the outside of the dressing. This will effectively draw away any serous fluid or exudate from the wound bed, creating a good environment for healing. We then make vests 
on the right hand side in order to hold all this in place to stop some of that friction and shearing that we've already talked about. The next thing to consider is how often you'll need to make them dressing changes. And actually knowing your local products will be the key to this. Also considering what will be needed in order to do that dressing change effectively. That might need to be an increased pain relief regime, which you'll need to discuss with your MDT. I've added this article here for consideration, as when we're doing our dressing changes, we do need to consider the fact that we aerosol our bugs around the area. This might mean that we need to consider where these dressing changes take place, as we don't want to risk infection to our patients in nearby cubicles or bays if that's where you're nursing these patients. Thinking about where we nurse our burns patients is really important. Single side rooms is obviously the most preferable, especially when we know the infections within our patients can sometimes end up multi-resistant. However, you may not have the ability to do that. You may need to nurse them in a bay or even in a field hospital. Depending on what you have available to you, you will need to consider where your patients are. Keeping them apart may be the only thing you can do. And by doing that, you may reduce infections to other patients. Thinking about different personal protective strategies might be useful when we're considering our burn patient care. Sometimes you may need full PPE, and especially with our COVID-19 outbreak at the moment, you may need the full protection from the slide on the right. Equally remembering that we've just talked about that aerosol generating of our wound infections when we're doing dressing changes. So we may need to consider different strategies at different times of the day. Surgical gloves and a gown in order to reduce the infections to other patients. Additional nursing considerations will be understanding how well your patient is. And there are many studies out there showing that patients give signs of becoming unwell way before the patient actually does. By training your nursing staff on how to see this before it happens, will give you a head start on targeting these patients early. The nurse can collect data like input and output of fluids. We've heard already how important that is at the beginning, early stages. What the patient's eaten is really useful for our dietitians to work out our calorie requirements. Our burns patients struggle with temperature control and the nurse is able to assist on this. Providing our patients with emotional support, and sometimes that's the patient and families, they may have seen these traumas, it's really important. Again, like we talked about earlier, the nurse is with these patients and families probably the most amount of the time, and they provide these emotional support and relationships that these families need. And then additionally, organising the families to be within that care needed for these patients. This brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I've highlighted the need for a training for your nursing staff. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thanks very much, Nicole. Nicole, Nicole you have to share two... your screen, sorry, just before they introduce the next speaker. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Naeem, go on, carry on. Yeah, well, we're uh, sharing the screen of um, Prabita. I'd like to introduce her. Um, Ms. Pravita Sharma uh, is from Indore in India. She's a consultant dietitian in Burns for the last 13 years at the Chokram Hospital and Research Center in Indore. She's a, a faculty member of Interburn for Advanced Burn Care Nurse Program and also an honorary lecturer at Queen Mary's University, London for the MSc course for burn care. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, Rabina. Very good afternoon to one and all. Myself, Pratibha Sharma, consultant dietitian at Choitram Hospital and Research Center in Dhar, India. Also nutrition faculty with Interburn, which is a global group of training, education and research in Bern. 
First of all, I would like to thank BBA and B First for providing me this wonderful opportunity to speak about a very vital subject of burn care management. Nutrition support exists as the second most important part of the burn treatment. And so today I'm going to talk about nutrition support strategies and concerns in management of acute burn. Poor nutrition is the risk factor for mortality in burns and the prevalence of malnutrition is really, really high in burn. Malnutrition is a condition which includes both overnutrition and undernutrition. And to find out pre-morbid nutritional status is really, really important at the time of hospitalization. Malnutrition has really a bad impact on the burn outcome, so we have to take care of this part. And this is the major concern when we provide good nutrition support in burns. Let's talk about the nutrition support in burns. What all are the objectives for good nutrition support? There are three major objectives to provide good nutrition support. First and foremost is to achieve optimum nutritional adequacy. Second is to prevent weight loss and muscle loss. And finally, to promote wound healing and faster recovery so that your patient can go back their home and can rejoin their work as soon as possible. This nutrition support strategy is based on a nutrition care process model, which is a standard care process. And it defines four different steps. First step of this care process model is to assess your patient from nutrition point of view at the time of admission. Why you need to assess your patient's nutritional status at the time of admission? As I have mentioned earlier also in my slide that to find out the pre-morbid nutritional status is really, really important for nutrition intervention in burns. And we have developed this a nutrition assessment and monitoring tool for burns at our center. If you can see here in this slide, I have a sample from my unit. And this tool is based on the ABCD methodology, which includes anthropometric assessment, biochemical assessment, clinical assessment, and dietary assessment. Let's talk about all these Anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, and dietary assessment in detail. Anthropometry is where you need to check weight of your patient at the time of admission. You need to check height of your patient. And if you are not able to assess weight of your patient, you can simply go through the ideal body weight. Biochemical parameters include hemoglobin, total leukocyte count, serum protein levels, and this is specific investigations like for renal failure patients, you need to check the renal function test. For liver failure, you need to check liver function test. Also, the clinical assessment includes percentage of total burn surface area, depth of burn, inhalation injury, shock and delayed hours of resuscitation, along with the comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, cirrhosis, renal failure, etc., etc., And the dietary assessment includes previous history of the usual diet pattern, the cultural and religious beliefs towards the diet, and their food habits, whether they are vegetarian, non-vegetarian, and over-vegetarian. So at my center, we have most of the patients are strict vegetarian. Then after this nutrition assessment, we have to calculate nutritional requirement of individual burn patient. And that is dependent on the percentage of total burn surface area, their weight. And accordingly, you can calculate the calorie, protein, and other macro and micronutrients. So if you can see here uh, in the slides, few calculation I kept for the reference. 
and uh, for the major burns you can uh, use kareri formula which is a gold standard formula for all major burns who are more than 20 percent burn and uh, for protein you can calculate 1.5 grams per kg of the body weight with the addition of wound protein losses if the wounds are open and not covered with the graft and collagen dressing carbohydrate and protein fat sorry fat you can distribute by using 60 as 240 ratio from non protein calories do not forget to check with the non protein calorie versus nitrogen ratio because all the critical care guidelines have emphasized to provide at least 100 as to 1 ratio and burn all major burns are also considered as the critically ill patient micronutrient supplementation you can add vitamin c 500 mg twice in a day vitamin e 400 mg per day a multivitamin tablet and do not forget to check with the fiber in the diet and the recommended amount is 10 to 15 grams per 1000 kilocalories for minor burns you can refer using the recommended dietary allowance with the addition of 10 to 20 percent extra calories because their requirement is not too high so every individual country has their own rda defined so you can use these rda tables uh, to estimate the calorie requirement the next step is to decide feeding modalities and we all know that oral is the most preferred route of feeding and it has no complications but you can also prefer oral with enteral feeds and in particular situation enteral feeds are also recommended parenteral roots are rarely used because they have a lot of complications associated and you need to do a lot of monitoring as well and how you can decide which mode of feeding is required for individual subject so for that you have to uh, be very clear that all the patients who can eat orally and who can achieve their requirement through oral route you have to be strict on that feeding modalities for those patients who have a bigger burn and they cannot achieve their higher nutritional demand you can suggest oral plus enteral feed and I have few examples here if you can see on the top a female eating orally sitting comfortably so and her requirement is also not so high so she can fulfill her uh, nutritional demand through oral route the second uh, photograph is with the oral and enteral route where this lady is eating orally as well as she has an ng feed we prefer feeding our patient uh, nocturnal if they have oral and enteral both the roots so that they are allowed to eat oral food for whole day and overnight we can feed them through this uh, continuous drip method the another picture is uh, with completely enteral feeds and uh, here if you can see a bag hanging aside of this patient uh, is a continuous drip method of feeding enteral feeds and that is the easiest and uh, easily tolerable method of enteral feed patients are so comfortable uh, they don't have any abdominal issues and uh, because the slow rate of feeding is is really easy and good to accept parenteral route is only preferred when all the other routes are fail and you can't feed your patient through oral and enteral routes then you can pick parenteral route and it is rarely we select this mode of feeding these are the dietary sources we recommend for our burn patients high protein food items includes all non-vegetarian food items milk and milk products and lentils high calorie food items are those locally available food items which has cereals which has pulses as well as some amount of fat in that so that they are dense in calories the last and uh, the most important part of this care process model is to monitor and reassess nutrition support 
Daily monitoring of nutrient intake through 24 hour diet recall method is recommended in all burn patient. You have to uh, take the 24 hour food intake and you can convert it into calorie and protein so that you can have an idea whether they are taking sufficient calorie or not taking adequate calorie in their diet. And accordingly, you can decide further intervention strategies. Also, you need to check with the GI symptoms, for example, loose motions, vomiting, and constipation, because you need to modify their diet if they have any one out of these GI symptoms. RT aspiration, uh, up to 500 ml is uh, considerable, but uh, above 500 ml uh, is is a concern and you can reduce the volume of feeding and uh, you have to check the bowel sound frequently for these patients. You have to monitor screen graphs to find out the success of your nutrition support, whether the grafts are accepted or rejected, whether the wounds are healing or not healing. Because if you are providing sufficient calories and your patient are not performing well with the skin grafts, their grafts are rejected, their wounds are not healing. It means you have to add on some other intervention strategies like anabolic steroid to, to reduce the hypermetabolism. For weekly monitor, you can consider weight of your patient. You can consider uh, the repeat investigation of serum proteins and HB and TLC count. I have got few of the case studies. Thank you everyone for patient listening. I hope this session has bring you some insight and empowered you with the nutrition knowledge. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much Pratibha. It was very thought-provoking. Um, and while our next speaker, Ruth Han Fanston, actually shares uh, share her screen, I would like to welcome her and introduce to the audience. Ruth Han Fanston is from Swansea in the UK. Uh, she has over 20 years experience as a burn physiotherapist and has spent a significant amount of time in lower middle income country settings. She's currently doing her PhD into risk factors of burn contracture formation in lower to middle income countries at Swansea University. Ruthann, are you ready to start? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. So it's really wonderful to be with you here today. So we'll jump straight into this very important topic. So therapy is focusing on improving quality of life. And we aim to limit or ideally prevent disability, disfigurement, and the pain and suffering that can be associated with a burn injury. Sorry, I forgot, I need to do the slides. There we go. Take a minute to look at that before I move on. So what are some of the tools that we have to achieve our aims? We'll just briefly look at each of the basic tools. When it comes to inhalation injury, chest physiotherapy is really important. So we can use positioning, uh, breathing exercises, mobilization, and secretion clearing techniques to assist in improving lung volumes and clearing excessive secretions. And this can improve oxygenation. So whether the patient is ventilated or not, the chest physiotherapy plays a very important role in this um, circumstance. We also have an important role to play in the edema of uh, the management of edema. So we um, encourage positioning that elevates the affected part and we initiate active movement as soon as possible. Edema can obviously reduce range and limit function and ultimately can reduce wound healing 
which may have a later impact on scarring and therefore is extremely important. Connected to this is our role in positioning. So often the position of comfort is going to be the position of contracture. As you can see here, we can literally see in front of our eyes patients sticking in the position of comfort because obviously moving can be painful and um, patients may be wanting to avoid the more anti-contracture positions, which you can see in the text box here as the standard positions to prevent contracture. We're able to use whatever we have available to us to um, position our patients in the anti-contracture position. So for example, with a axilla burn, especially right into the dome of the axilla, we're gonna abduct the shoulder to 90 degrees and um, with the lower limbs, extension at the knees, ideally the hips, if not neutral, and plantigrade at the ankles. Another example of the neck, we want to avoid the flexion position in which the contractor may well want to develop and encourage extension. Another role, splinting. Splinting can be used to improve range of movement and to prevent the loss of range of movement. It can also be used post-operatively to immobilize a limb, say after grafting, and um, less commonly to protect certain structures or reduce edema. Thermoplastic splinting material may not be available, um, but it also may not be the most appropriate option for a number of reasons. So we can use our imagination, we can be creative and use what we have locally available. Here's an example of a drain pipe made into an axilla splint and um, some suction tubing into a neck collar. So we can therefore apply principles, general principles of what makes a good splint to what we have. Those principles being such as a lightweight material that's washable, that's comfortable, that's moldable, but once molded is nice and rigid. Here's an example of other materials that one could, we could use. As to whether to splint, I find, especially in limited resources where pain may be um, difficult to manage and wounds are taking longer periods of time to heal, that splints are often the most efficient and effective way of getting an appropriate range. Sometimes a GA may be needed if it's later in the day and maintaining that range in the most effective and least painful way for the patient. Although obviously we want to remove that splint if possible and encourage active movement as well. Another tool is mobilization. The whole team, relatives can encourage this from day one. Patient may not be willing or keen, but it's extremely important to mobilize the patient as soon as possible for all patients other than those that are too critically ill. Another tool we have is exercise. So all types of exercise, whether it's passive done by the therapist or more active exercises, ideally delivered, moved by the patient. And primarily we're wanting to increase range of movement, prevent loss of range of movement, but also so important for improving their ability to do functional, uh, functional tasks, keep independent, gain, build strength, balance, and gain more independence. Generally, there's hardly any contraindication to pushing for full movement in a burn injury other than maybe occasionally exposed tendons on a hand, for example. Um, but obviously, post graft, we may, for a period of time, for example, five days in discussion with the surgeon, want to immobilize the limb and limit movement. But as soon as possible, um, ideally observing the graft, we want to push again for full movement. Function is a very important part of therapy but for the whole team to encourage from day one functional activities that stretch, that move the joints at risk of contracture and encourage the patient to be independent. 
And obviously with children, many of these tools can't be applied so directly and we must do this through play. I found this little boy on the ward playing with the toy that he was pulling along the ground, which was just reinforcing flexion of the neck, the possible contracture. So we switched the game to a balloon game, which made him have to look up into the anti-contractor position. And um, we used play as therapy. So if, if you're a surgeon, uh, you may do a brilliant skin graft, but if you don't have a supportive environment and other factors in place, that graft unfortunately may fail. Same with therapy. I'd like to finish with a few concepts that I believe are really important in the delivery of effective therapy and using these tools in the most effective way. So firstly, especially in limited resources, the longer a wound takes to heal, basically the worse the scarring. And for a therapist, and most importantly for a patient, wounds that take a long time to heal um, are gonna make it very difficult to achieve an ideal outcome. Same with pain. It's really difficult to get good outcomes with unmanageable pain. Even us without any burn injury, how often do we not want to do things that we know we should, especially when we're in pain, especially when there's fear and hope, hopelessness. So we can tell the patient to do X, Y, or Z, and we think as a therapist, it may be easy to achieve full range of movement, but there's so many different barriers that actually make it pretty difficult. And so we need to encourage an environment where the patient's level of comfort is at an acceptable level so we can achieve the kind of outcomes that we really want to. Capacity. Therapy takes time. It's very difficult to achieve anything in five minutes. It's also very difficult to achieve good outcomes just through advice, generally hands-on work with the patient because they don't want to often be doing what we're encouraging them to do is needed. And in many places I've worked, unfortunately, there aren't therapists and doctors do an amazing job. The words of a doctor are so powerful. Uh, patients follow doctors' words, but at the end of the day, they need help to do what we advise them to do and encouragement and um, hands-on treatment. Um, so the impact of capacity follows through into many areas, such as prioritization of who we choose to see. Possibly it's more useful to spend more time with a less number of patients and affect their outcome for the rest of their life than maybe five minutes with 50 patients and leaving them pretty much unchanged. In terms of referrals, um, an early referral to the therapy team, if there is a therapy team, is absolutely crucial. Leaving a referral to near wound healing or near discharge is always going to be generally too late. Therapy needs to start on day one. Start, it needs to start at the beginning. Another important concept I believe is important for the therapist is to have a general good understanding of burn care, especially when it comes to viewing wo wounds and being comfortable with knowing the depth of the wound in discussion with the medical team and um, um, understanding wound healing because essentially that is what dictates the therapist's treatment plan and the intensity of what they need to do. For example, the hand injury there isn't gonna require pretty much any time from a therapist, it's gonna heal without scarring. Whereas this axilla burn is gonna need intensive input, even if in the first week that range is absolutely full, it's gonna be struggle and need a lot of time. Remember that the smallest things that we do in the acute stage sometimes can have huge impact later on uh, in the patient's life. Small things make a huge difference. Nearly there. What also is important is, as it says here, atmosphere, culture. Can we create in our wards a culture, an atmosphere that encourages movement, that um, encourages independence, that encourages uh, function? And again, for that, we need a, a baseline level of comfort so that the patient is free to exercise and move around. But that can cut through needing a lot of um, input from staff and um, a lot of equipment, just creating that atmosphere. And obviously, 
patient education is crucial. The patients need to understand why they need to do this thing that often they don't want to do. You may have heard of the term physioterrorist, unfortunately, um, but we need to find uh, compassionate and imaginative ways of encouraging the patient to invest in the short term for an out to a, a longer term good outcome. My penultimate slide, you can see here two very similar burns, full thickness burns to the anterior aspects of the neck, and we can see two very different outcomes. And we can learn from this the power that we have as a burn care team to influence people's lives save lives, change lives, and improve lives. And that is a result of effective healthcare systems and effective burn care teams. And we can see here the patient on the right has had a number of therapy interventions as well as important surgical um, interventions such as um, grafting, pressure, splinting, which will be part of talk two. So I'd really like to thank you. I'd like to thank you, thank my colleagues um, working in low middle income countries who I've learned pretty much everything I've learned from and um, the hard work that you do in this very difficult area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks very much for the great talk. So we, uh, we have um, wonderful five speakers. Uh, we have Opoko and um, Pratiba from, from from India and uh, and and uh, Ghana, and you showed us how uh, the burn care too can be really high standards in anywhere else in the world. And we have three speakers from from UK, and also they have shown us that um, you can still have the um, excellent care with very limited uh, resources. And burn care to be excellent doesn't need to be expensive. And that was shown really with uh, Mike, Nicole, and Ruth for time. Um, uh, we will ask a few questions. Um, are we still sharing screen, Ruth? No. So that's, we, know we are run out of time, so we're going to take very quick questions, one each, and the uh, answer has to be very quick too, please. So, Obuku, there was a question about. Um, timing of your excision. You said you do early excision and uh, you do, uh, do you do skin grafts at the same time or do you stage the skin graft? Popoku, you are with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Naim. Um, because of the local uh, constraints, so this is done in very limited uh, situations. But then when we do this, uh, we usually do it within the first between usually between 48 to 48 hours to five days after the after the burn, usually try and do it within the first week because the peak of the inflammatory response is usually after the first week. So you try to do it when the inflammatory response is at a lower level. And then um, this also depends on the size and extent of the of the burn. And um, with the with the grafting. I usually look at it, but if, if, I, if I'm happy with the way the bed is and the, the hemostasis that are, is secured, then I'll apply the skin immediately. If not, I'll wait. Um, do, so I'll just have as a skin, put it back on, and then uh, within the 48 hour period, you can just kind of gently take it off and then reapply it onto the, uh, onto the bed without actually needing uh, anesthesia. Thank you. Moses, uh, you have a Quick question. Yes, I, I'll, I'll ask a quick question from Mike. Mike, are you there? I'm there. Thank you, Muslim. Hi. Um, this question, many of the participants are also asking, what, with your experience in Ghana, what is the safe limit of percentage of burn that you can excise, tangentially excise in one go, in acute setting? Well, as has been indicated, what we want to look at is maybe their box score, but more importantly, their comorbidities and what the patient's like when they present to you. So it's really a case of working out with your surgeon what you're going to do and when you're going to stop. And the key features that I look at when I'm anesthetizing a patient to, to stop is if the patient's temperature is deteriorating quickly, I think that it's a kind of 
unknown thing, but I'm very worried if I have a patient who, say, drops two to three degrees in temperature in theatre, and I'll maybe then ask the surgeon to stop. The other feature, obviously, is cardiovascular instability and bleeding, because if you've got a patient who has some myocardial depression from a large burn to begin with, you're going to watch it. So I don't make hard and fast rules, but what, like I try to emphasize in my talk is that throughout the whole case, myself and my surgeon, Mr. Watson, are talking to each other before we start and after and, and looking at goals and giving each other signals as to when we think we can continue and stop. Thank you very much. Thanks. For um, Nicole, there was a, a question raised in the uh, chat box about um, the use of uh, acetic acid in, in burns and what is the evidence? Um, so um, we use um, acetic acid um, on some of our wound infections. Um, we make up uh, preparations um, and change it regularly. Um, there is some um, evidence that's out there um, that's been put into the Burns Journal. Um, I don't have it on the top of my head though, um, but I can definitely share that after. And then what sort of concentration it comes as 5%? Do you use it straight as 5% or do you dilute it? No, we dilute down. Um, so we dilute down um, our bottles of acetic acid um, into um, a thousand mils. Um, again, um, it's a two percent bottle that we reduce down to a thousand mils with saline. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, a quick question. Uh, name, if allow, if you allow me, a quick question Please. from Pratiba. Are you there, Pratiba? Yeah. I yeah. So uh, in the in your patients, when you are using the um, enteral, uh, enteral feeds, do you use nasogastric or some other tubes like uh, nasoduodenal tubes that people have uh, uh, actually advocated? Okay. Thank you for your question. We use nasogastric because nasogastric is a really difficult task. We need endoscopy and we need USG guided things with that. And we frequently change the tubes like every week or we just keep a label on that and we keep changing the tubes. So that's how we do it at our center. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. The last question is really to Ruth and um, um, you mentioned in your talk about early mobilization, and um, I, I know that uh, there is a practice of um, early mobilization even, even when the patient is intubated. So what you would advise our colleagues in low-income country regarding early mobilization in, in your view? And when to start? Ruth? You're mute. We, we can you. start from day one, unless the patient is critically ill. And as you said, in a high income setting, that's happening when the patient's intubated and very, very early on. But I haven't um, had that experience in a low resource setting that that's been possible. Um, so generally, um, it's on the ward, mm -hmm. but ideally as early as possible. And as you know, many of the patients aren't in ITU, so we can start as early as the medical team are happy for us to get the patient up as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for all the speakers. And uh, sorry, we're a little bit behind time, but I'm sure this Nadim will forgive us. We'll hand over to Nadim. Uh, the opposite. Thank you, Naeem. That was a fantastic session. Thank you uh, to Naeem and uh, Marzan for chairing that session and to all the speakers. We gave it you a very, very hard brief uh, by having to fit so much into such a short time. So I'm very, very grateful. We've only overrun by 10 minutes. Um, we're going to have a five minute break. We're trying to answer as many of the questions you're typing online. So please keep the questions coming. And uh, we're going to take a five minute break. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the speakers and chairs for that session. Thank you.
Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Avira Heinze, I'm a junior doctor in London, and I'd like to give a warm welcome to our chairs for the next session. Dr. Patrick Ture from Sierra Leone is a physician with a specialty in infectious diseases. He is also a member of the board of directors of Research Africa, and he is a Hubert Humphrey Fellow. Dr. Mark Fisher is a plastic surgeon at the University of Iowa, USA and he is serving the Burns Unit and is the Director of Cleft and Craniofacial. He's also Chair of the American Burns Association Ad Hoc Committee on Burn Reconstruction. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and it's such a pleasure and an honor to be uh, here with the group. Um, the, uh, the first thing I'd like to start off with on this session, uh, the session we're about to do is on the subject of the intersection of burns in LMICs with COVID, which is I think on many of our minds. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions that we'd like to start off the discussion with before uh, we go into our, our speakers. Um, so if we, I wonder if we could start up with the questions. Great. So the, this first one is regarding COVID-19 infections in your staff and your burn unit. We're curious whether this has had an impact on, on folks. Are you losing staff? So 
staff have not been infected. Some have been infected, but all have recovered or have some places actually had critical illness or, or deaths within staff? And we'll come back to the uh, results from these questions a little bit later for, for some discussion. So you can, uh, uh, we'll uh, come back to this data shortly. Let's go to the next question, please. Sorry, Mark, you should be able to see the, uh, the results. Um, I can read them if, if you can't see them. Oh, um, we're going to come back to discuss these in uh, a little bit later. Um, it's just great to sort of get the polling done and we'll come back to the discussion in a little bit. Okay, then I'll go for the next one. Um, so the question here is, how has COVID impacted the practice of burns? Um, there can be a variety of reasons why you may have variations in volume. It could be because you were shut down or it could be because burns really diminished in volume. So is uh, the care of COVID in your, in your unit normal right now? Are you doing less burn care? Is it severely decreased or practically zero? Are there no burns or are you shut down? Um, of course, PPE has been on many of our minds because of a variety of issues, particularly in the constraints of, uh, of an LMIC environment. So have you had widely available PPE and you're using it appropriately? Uh, is it kind of constrained, in which case you're using it on a, you know, in, on a sort of a limited basis? Or do you, apart from your usual PPE, do you have no additional PPE because of COVID concerns? And I think we just have one last question before we continue. Um, and then we're curious about, uh, th there's also the, ac ac uh, the uh, economic aspect of things um, uh, and just um, strategic movement of, of staff. So have some of your staff uh, within the burn unit been redeployed to either COVID or, or other activity? Have some uh, been put off of work uh, for a period of time because of changes in volume or because of COVID in general in order to uh, keep up with sort of public health recommendations? Are you doing your normal uh, burn um, uh, or is there a mix where you're sending some to the COVID effort? Hopefully these questions make sense. I think that was our last question. Um, uh, together, uh, my co-chair today is Patrick Turay. Uh, uh, Patrick, would you like to get the session started? I think you're you're muted at the moment. Mark, I'm not 100% sure if Patrick's online at the moment. I'm just trying to double check that, but it may be worth you carrying on for the moment till I just work that out. Uh, you're on mute, Mark. Yes, uh, I am online. There's Patrick. Hello. Perfect. Good hello. Morning. Hello. Good afternoon, all. Um, I'm Patrick from Sierra Leone. I will be introducing the first speaker. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Tanvir Ahmed. He's a plastic surgeon from Dhaka, Bangladesh. He's a previous BFIST fellow, scientific secretary of Society of Plastic Surgeons of Bangladesh and faculty for EMSB, ATLS and surgical skill courses as well as academic coordinator for the postgraduate plastic surgery residency program. Welcome, Dr. Tanvir. Thank you. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And I'll be highlighting on the uh, COVID-19 and burn care in Bangladesh. And I'll be focusing on the Sheikh Hasina National Institute of Burn and Plastic Surgery. And as you know, Bangladesh is a small uh, South Asian country with a big population of 170 million. And Dhaka is our capital. And already Bangladesh is overburdened with burn cases. And our health system is completely based on 
the government health services. And at this moment in our country, we have 121 plastic surgeons working uh, in the, all over the country. And in our public sector, we have 16 burn centers and four small burn centers in the uh, private and one of them into the uh, uh, Bangladesh army. And we are fortunate enough, we have a, a remarkable watch here. We, we have got a 500 bedded brand new Sheikh Hasina National Institute of Burn and Plastic Surgeon in Dhaka. Uh, this is said to be the world's largest one. This is named under, uh, after the name of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Actually, uh, previously we were working in this hospital. This is the 300 bedded burn and plastic surgery unit of Dhaka Medical College. Now it is, uh, it becomes the second largest one. We just shifted in our new hospital in July uh, 2019, and we softly started our function in the new hospital in 2000, September 2019. The, uh, some of the works are yet to be finished. But due to the uh, recent changes, uh, our 300 bedded hospital at DMCH, actually they, they used to take a huge load of our burn cases of Bangladesh. Uh, at a point of time, they used to treat with 500 patients. But uh, due to the government decision, they become converted to a COVID dedicated hospital and all of the patients are vacated and shifted to a new hospital. And again, in 2nd July, our new hospital, in our new hospital, government decided to admit some of the COVID patients and to allocate the cabins for the COVID positive doctors. What happened in across the country, 10 of our barn units are now stopped or limited in function and uh, which are almost uh, depriving 950 admitted patients. So this is the changing scenario of this country. And this is the part where we are admitting the 60 non-burn uh, non COVID patients. And this cabin block is dedicated for the doctors who becomes positive. And they have their own uh, movement plans and separate uh, uh, entry and exit. And before the COVID, we used to deal with a huge number of burn patients. In 2019, in the old hospital, we dealt with the, around 64,000 uh, patients in outdoor and indoor, uh, with around 7,400 patients in inpatient department. At this moment, in our new hospital, we have 309 admitted patients. And in the emergency in 24 seven, we are serving with 40 to 45 patients. And in our outpatient department, we are dealing with 20 to 25 patients. What used to be actually in the usual time, we used to deal with that 200 to 250 patients in a day. And we have the scope for another 60 COVID patients. And in Bangladesh, actually the first three cases were detected in 8 March of 2020 and uh, government started the lockdown on 22nd March. But in the meantime, we started our preparation in our hospital. Uh, actually, initially we had some limitations as a developing country. We have our limitations in the procurement of the PPE, protective equipments, testing facilities, and so on. That is why we aimed on this protocol, first to target the elimination, engineering controls, and the administrative controls over the PPE. That is why we called on an emergency meeting for our academic council and the management committee on 18 March. And then we stopped our morning session. That is the academic activities, stopped all academic activities. We relocated our OPD and uh, emergency department. We stopped our OPD and shifted it to the emergency department for a unified movement. And we restricted the entry for all the visitors. And we've changed our hospital movement plan. And we revised all of our duty rosters and make ships for the doctors to to uh, preserve our manpower. And we installed a lot of hand sanitizing system, disinfection systems, and the screening for the healthcare providers. And we procured, we started procurement of the uh, PPE, mostly focused on the reusable PPEs due to, uh, to conserve the uh, money. And we started the trial of our reusable PPE and masks and the sterilization procedures. And we reduced our operating theater from eight to three. Actually, we have uh, 12 operating theaters, but we stopped uh, actually now we are running only three and we have revised our admission criteria and we stopped admitting all routine cases 
and these are some of our posters and orders and uh, uh, things we actually posted in different parts of the hospital look we changed our uh, emer uh, the uh, admission and OT rosters we actually start our preparation with a drill because we are a new hospital some functions are not still functioning but we started with some drill to tackle with the uh, upcoming situation and our uh, uh, management people started to work with our nurses doctors our security personnel and the dressers and how to use the PPE and how to tackle the situation and we started we actually implemented the physical distancing in all waiting areas and we started the screening in all the gates and we dedicated some transport for our healthcare uh, workers and as we don't have any IPC but we started procuring the uh, materials for our cleaning and disinfection and we already procured the different uh, types of the reusable and autoclavable pp to be available for everyone and we separated these with three different colors for different sizes and we personally procured the face marks for our use and we some of us actually tried to develop some of the videos to teach how to use those things and we activated our cssd to autoclave our uh, pp coveralls to reuse it uh, in a safely manner and also we have the scope to sterilize all of our face marks for the plasma sterilization if required as we are a developing country and uh, previously i said uh, we have our testing facility limitations and the support so that is why we aim in this tool uh, to, uh, for admitting or treating any patient in the emergency we have divided in the main symptoms and the less common symptoms as usual in the main symptom we have two that is the new fever and or new cough and number two is the newly developed respiratory distress or the shortness of breath and in the less common symptoms list we had the fatigue myalgia sore throat headache diarrhea or vomiting and the anosmia and we always keep in mind the red zone or hotspot areas from where the patient is coming and in the covid green actually uh, in, in most of the cases used to admit they are with one uh, of the less common symptoms with none of the main symptoms and the covid yellow used to be sent to the isolation words one of the following that is the one main symptom and none of the less common or two or more of the less common symptoms and for the covid red actually we never try to admit those patients used to refer to our next hospital and any one of the following that is the both of the main symptoms or one main symptom and one or more number of the less common symptoms and this is the chart actually uh, either the suspected covid patients or the suspected symptoms or from how for area patients or any patient who are admitted into the wards already if they develop the new symptoms then we used to send those patients to the level one at isolation ward and prepare to send for the sample for the COVID tests. Thereafter, if the result comes the positive, then we used to shift it to our old hospital that is very close. And if comes negative, negative then we used to do or deal it accordingly. And this is our uh, government uh, trials protocol. These are the some cases we used to deal with in our emergency department. And we try to uh, complete our dressing immediately after receiving the patient and we try to uh, select the burn dressing which requires less changes and immediately after dressing and admission we try to send all of the investigations and complete the uh, uh, treatment and this is how our doctors are taking their uh, protection and treating the patient in the emergency department and in our uh, words we have educated spacing in between the beds and we have stopped using our central air conditioner and kept open all of our doors and the windows for uh, air and uh, ventilation and we have imposed that patients and their attendants should wear the masks and we are virtually monitoring every activities by our senior faculties and the consultants even at from home through our different social media apps even in the midnight we can answer to our uh, residents who are treating into the emergency and our barn icu we have cleaned it and our, they have their all protective measures and at the, it is now very busy with the barn patients 
and actually we are not admitting any COVID patient in our burn unit. Uh, in uh, sorry, in our burn ICU. And uh, if required to serve the patients, we use our portable uh, exhumations or some other instruments. And we very recent we have started the sample collection for the RT-PCR for all of our star, uh, staffs and the patients who undergo surgery. And we have stopped admitting the uh, uh, cases which actually potential to develop the AZTs, it is the aerosol generating procedures. And in operating theaters, we ensured the PP for everyone. And we have minimized the exposure during the intubation and the extubation time. And we have considered already uh, discussing um, to procure this sort of thing, the glidoscopes. And we have minimized the movement of the staff at our operating theaters by rescheduling re re the team. And we have our uh, HVAC system, the negative pressure air flow system with the linear and uh, laminar flows. And we have activated it and regularly cleaning the things. And we have stopped stopped using this SGB producing procedures like the passengers and the drills and the uh, our dermatomes and our surgeons have their full support for the PPE face shields but some of the marks to procure by themselves actually we all are now focusing on the service but our hospital not only a service of hospital that is also an educational institution we have 85 residents so the mostly affected part of our service uh, activities is academic activities. Very recent, we started our virtual classes and the online exams and the Zoom meeting for our uh, administrative and academic purposes. And we actually running it under our TRS Academia, that is the virtual class classroom. And in every day, we are taking our lecture classes from our senior faculties. It starts at 7.30 p.m. after the hospital work. And very recent, we first offered a lottery through Barbara. Actually, they offered two tickets for our residents to join in the Gonga hand surgery course. Thanks to B first and Barbara for allowing us to join over there. And we are regularly joining these sorts of academic activity across the world. Thank you. And the situation in Bangladesh, actually, in terms of the infection among the doctors, really very sad. Till date, we have lost 68 doctors in Bangladesh that died from COVID-19. And we have, as per today's uh, data, we have 1,962 doctors been positive, 1,514 nurses, and 2,114 health, other uh, healthcare workers are positive till date from the COVID-19 during their service. And in our hospital, we have already 40 uh, doctors, nurses, and other staffs been positive from the COVID-19, but no doubt. Gradually, they are getting negative. Unfortunately, we lost one of our plastic surgeons in Bangladesh. So, in the at the end, our suggestions from our view that is for the burn units needs future plan for infectious diseases. That is very important. And I think infection prevention control committee is required, which is lacking in most of the low and middle countries and we need, we need to establish the negative pressure or HVAC systems in our operation theater, ICU, age and the isolation wards and arrangements for the personal protective equipment for long time and strong personal hygiene and health education programs are mandatory and advocate for a control referral system from where the COVID and non-COVID patient to be transferred that has to be traced and strengthening the research and the publication that is our another lacking and we need to establish the collaborations and the digital learning platform to share our ideas between the institutes from home and abroad. Thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed that a lot, um, Tanvir. Uh, I think there's um, so much material there and you've clearly done an expert job in uh, assessing the situation and coming to up with a, um, a really organized approach. And yet there's been considerable uh, difficulty uh, with your staff, which is remarkable. I think we need to learn from that. Um, uh, uh, thoughts from you, Patrick, before we proceed to our next talk? I think we need to unmute you. Sorry, Patrick. Hello.
Hello. Yes. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. We move over to the next presentation. The next presentation is by Professor Adeline Muganzi from Johannesburg, South Africa. He is the director of the Bunch Unit at Chris Ani Baragwanath Academic Hospital, University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He is the past president of South African Bond Society and is now secretary of fellow American College of Surgeons South African chapter. Welcome, Professor Adling. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, do you have my talk? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you have my talk on the screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Fine. Thanks. Uh, we had a report that um, uh, burns is decreasing during. Um, Uh, lockdown are uh, just for 4,000. And, um, but the number for non COVID burns is still high. Uh, we are in the middle of uh, winter. Uh, we look at the last uh, three years. So uh, we're still admitting uh, plus minus uh, 50 patients uh, every month. So these are the challenges, uh, as you know, that uh, we've got a very very uh, limited uh, uh, resources, uh, very few dedicated burn centers. And uh, today, most of the intensive care admissions are full with uh, non-burn COVID patient. And uh, what is uh, troubling a little bit is um, the relocation of equipment and the personnel to the non-COVID, uh, non-burn COVID uh, ward. Um, in my uh, uh, own centers, uh, many uh, junior uh, colleagues have been uh, relocated to uh, those intensive care to look after the COVID uh, patient. Limited uh, testing capacity, uh, it has been a big problem, though uh, at the moment uh, we're sorting out in South Africa, but uh, I've been in contact with uh, other colleagues uh, in, in Africa where the PCR can, uh, results can come in even after one week, two weeks. Uh, shortage of for PPE, um, it has been a problem uh, all the time. But uh, what I'm seeing now uh, in South Africa, many of companies are trying to do some innovations. I've seen uh, some of the uh, companies actually uh, are making a washable uh, PPE uh, that can wash up to 70 times and, and, um, and clean it, sterilize it. I think that's the way to go. So this is a really a um, uh, I would say unknown field, and there's no evidence-based medicine sometimes, but we have to use our common sense. So what preparation that we've done uh, in our center? Uh, first of all, we said, okay, we need to protect the burn center, because if we get the burn center with a full of uh, COVID uh, patient, then it will be a... Uh, a disaster being treated properly. And we realized that um, uh, looking at the other surgical patients that have been moved to the um, uh, COVID world, uh, we just realized that uh, those patients are really not managed properly. And uh, if you send a patient with a major burns to those wards, there's no chance that patient will survive. So we came to the conclusion that uh, most of all those patients, we need to make a plan to treat them with in the center. So we have to subdivide the unit and the personnel to treat those patients. So what we've done, uh, we've created a, uh, a sort of two uh, cubicles ICU. Uh, we're using it as a PUI, patient under investigations. And then if it's negative, we send them to normal ward. We use a lot of telemedicine. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I know that there are some regulations uh, in your countries, but uh, there's no money at the moment. We have to go to the easy way. And the easy way for us is a, a WhatsApp group, uh, which is working quite, quite well. We have to, to make a judgment on many of the patients uh, based on uh, 
uh, good pictures on uh, Android uh, cell phones. So just to show you quickly uh, what we've done in the world, this is my unit ICU, we've got uh, 12 of them. So we've, we've, we've isolated two uh, cubicles that we're using as a, a, a patient under investigations, uh, when there's a suspicion, and then um, uh, we'll send this patient to um, normal world if uh, the test is uh, negative. Of course, uh, there's no more female and uh, male uh, toilet. We'll have to divide the toilet. And then this um, treatment room uh, for adult side, we've got two uh, of them. Uh, we'll have uh, at the level, we call it our self level one, uh, to change it, uh, I mean, to relocate one for COVID brain patient and one for non-COVID brain patient. We stop uh, having a meeting into the boardroom. So uh, uh, all our meetings and the teaching are happening outside. Uh, we try to do it around the, uh, 11 uh, a.m. when there is a sun and um, it's work, working quite well. In terms of a wound care, uh, there's not really change in the way we're managing the wound. Uh, we protect ourselves and uh, we have um, motivated uh, a long-lasting dressing. Uh, in our cases, um, we found the nanocrystalline ActiCoat, uh, Silvalone, uh, uh, are the uh, dressing that you can use uh, on a patient for three, four days because we want to limit the uh, nursing time and uh, less exposure as well for all of us. And sometimes we do use the honey dressing because sometimes uh, this dressing, we can leave it for more than 48 hours. And um, it has been a practice for a long time in the unit. In terms of surgical management, uh, we're still applying the early excision. Uh, there are situations where we did uh, delay early excision, meaning that we have to excise within a week. And the reason, because those patients that were PUI, patients under investigation for COVID, and um, in fact, we did a study in the past. Uh, for us, early excision without cover uh, is even uh, better than delay early excision. It means that you do excision within a week. Uh, surgical team, we do provide uh, PPE for all um, uh, those working in, in, a, in a operating room, um, but uh, we, we try to encourage the young because the most uh, reliable low risk uh, factor is age. So um, we try to encourage the youngest to, to go more in theater in operating the, uh, room. Um, of course, we we there to to direct them. We there to to help them. We've we've we had a couple of anesthetists. Um, uh, they were reported COVID uh, positive, and uh, from uh, our investigations, in fact, those anesthetists came um, positive. So they got it from some other places, and um, uh, fortunate stuff. And um, we've been using this uh, uh, machine here. Uh, it's like a, a mobile lamina flow. Actually, what it does, it clean air um, uh, continuously. Uh, it has um, some laser, uh, I mean, um, not laser therapy. It's got uh, some uh, filtration and uh, it circulates blood air, air constantly uh, in, a, in a operating room. Uh, so we put the machine, uh, um, before we start uh, during the procedure and we continue later on. It has been there before, even the COVID area. So it's a way for us to minimize the uh, uh, contamination. So as you can see, uh, all these uh, um, procedures, there's no way that we cannot do them. We have to do them. We do intubation. We have to do suctioning. But here, we use the closed suction to, to avoid uh, 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 spillage of uh, uh, the viruses. And um, the CPAP, we don't use the mask CPAP, but to use the, the tube uh, once the patient has been intubated. We didn't stop to use the VESA jet. We didn't stop to use the VESA jet. We, uh, we make sure that everyone is protected. We use that machine I told you to clean air all the time. And so far, there's never been really a problem with, with that. We try to reduce quite um, significantly the uh, outpatient. It means that we keep the patient a little bit longer and it's completely healed or very small uh, wound, then we can send the patient to the nearest clinic or nearest hospital so that we can reduce the uh, overflow of patient to the uh, outpatient 
uh, room. So this is the last uh, plan, we, we call it ourselves uh, plan uh, uh, level three. It means that uh, if the situation become un, uh, out of control, we, we've got uh, more than three, four patients, then we'll have to divide the unit in two. As you can see the door there, uh, it separates the adult and the pediatric um, uh, burns. Actually, uh, in pediatric, we've got two COVID pa uh, patients at the moment. But uh, when the situation will come uh, out of control, that's what we'll have to do. Uh, we divide uh, uh, the two uh, units. We will bring adult and uh, pediatric in one ward, and uh, in the other ward, we're going to call it a COVID burn. As I said again, we believe that uh, if patient has got severe burns, there's no way that uh, the patient will, 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 will survive in a normal COVID ward because I've seen how people are struggling just with a simple laparotomy there. So we have integrated uh, new that uh, COVID will come and uh, we received last year five, um, five million uh, pounds to extend the, the unit. So this is the old unit. And then actually we've we modified even the architecture because we said in the future, uh, there may be this problem. We must have a place to isolate patient uh, um, with burns having some problem instead of for sending those patient to another world. So in summary, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we said uh, our non-COVID burn remain high. Uh, we have limited the resources like any uh, low-income uh, countries. And um, we feel that a patient with burns, severe burns should be treated in a dedicated COVID burn center. And um, in the future, every time someone has to build a new uh, burn center, you must take into account the uh, 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 possibility of uh, isolating those patients uh, within the burn center. Thank you very much. Professor Adeline, that was uh, that was great. Um, your um, rec uh, recognition of the uh, what a big problem COVID is is already for us and going to be, particularly in an environment where the burn volume did not go down. You know, that's um, you know that's the reality that many of us are facing. We can't just assume that it's not going to come uh, to an environment where you know movement is less or something along those lines. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Patrick, do you have any comments on Professor Adeline's talk before we proceed to the next one? So um, I, wouldn't, uh, I am going to go next with a little bit of a sort of a uh, global perspective based on uh, a lot of the uh, webinars on COVID that have been in, involved with uh, out of the, the US and, um, and abroad or internationally. Um, I wonder if I could start off with the data from the survey that we did, because there's some pretty interesting trends that we're seeing within the audience that I think um, is very similar to what the speakers have been describing as well. Um, Adeline, you probably just need to unscrew, unshare your screen here, thanks. So Emma, is it possible to show those or shall I read the data that you sent us previously? I think I can share them, bear with me two seconds. Okay, great. So uh, this, was the, this was the first question. Um, uh, to what extent has COVID-19 had an impact on your, uh, on your particular center? Uh, no staff had been infected in just a third. 60% have had some of the staff infected and so, uh, but all recovered. And um, the, you know, what occurs to me is, you know, there's a considerable period of time where you had staff who were positive may or may not have known that they were positive, may have infected patients, uh, and that when they became positive, they presumably were taken out of, of duty for a period of time. Uh, and we see 5% of staff who have become uh, critically ill or, or centers have had staff that became critically ill uh, or died due to COVID. Uh, so this is no joke. Um, think about the amount of loss of burn system capacity during the period of time when people were sick and were quarantined and then came back 
uh, or the impact of, uh, of staff who then infected either one another or, or, uh, uh, or staff. Uh, Tanvir, uh, Patrick, uh, Adeline, uh, do you have any additional thoughts about this? Or have you seen it in your experience? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, I'm Tanvir, yeah. Uh, as you have sh seen in our country, uh, uh, the number of the doctors been positive or even in our hospital, we have 40 uh, people been positive, but no disaster happened. And every day we are getting the good news that they are gradually recovering. And uh, because uh, we are trying to give them proper service and the treatment. And secondly, uh, we are trying to reduce the number of the infection by providing the proper uh, PPE and the safety materials. That is very important. I think, I think uh, uh, the lesson that I learned from this is you know, it's uh, the percentage of people who get critically ill and die secondary to COVID. I'm so grateful it's not worse than it is. In a future pandemic, uh, imagine if we had similar transmission, but uh, significantly worse um, virulence. So I, th I think we need to learn from this and become better at identifying it and cohorting people quickly. Can we go to the next question, please? Uh, during COVID, burn care in my unit was um, just about a quarter said that they had normal volume. Um, about half people said that there was a little bit of a decrease, um, probably because of a combination of diminished incidents overall, but people are probably presenting a little bit less as well. Some places had a se severe decrease and others went to practically zero. And I think that's most likely because centers were shut down. So um, uh, the, the, the thing that occurs to me in this is, what about the unspoken volume of patients who uh, were neglected, have had delays in care, and have had increased problems? Um, Patrick, um, uh, what are your thoughts about this uh, change in the volume of, of burn care? Yes. In Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes, in our setting, what happened was um, as soon as COVID came around, a lot of, of patients avoided the main hospital settings. So many of them don't come to the general hospital for care. And so I think this might account for the low turnout of patients in facilities with bonds. Um, I, I think one of the main teaching points there is if, if you uh, had a system previously where there wasn't a strong connection either because of infrastructure or personal relationships, et cetera, between uh, a burn center and the surrounding region. This is a great region, uh, reason to develop those relationships. Uh, I think that's probably happened to a considerable extent. We've all had to reach out to our uh, referring centers more. Um, Adeline, have you had that experience as well, where you're communicating more with referring folks? Oh, oh yes, um, we, we, we've been in contact with uh, referral doctors all the time. And um, uh, as we said again, um, we believe that um, every patient coming from another hospital must be tested uh, so that um, we know uh, in advance if patient is COVID positive or not. Um, Great. Yeah, um, and, and we, as I said, we, we communicate by WhatsApp. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Um, Tanvir, at your center, you're doing enormous volume, um, uh, but did some of the burn volume go to regional hospitals? Did you feel like you had, it to, you had to support regional hospitals more? Actually, uh, uh, initially our DMCH unit, that is a 300 bedded one, they used to deal with 500 patients admitted at the point of time. But unfortunately, they're completely closed. So that is totally non-functional at this moment. So our doctors are uh, in working the COVID. In contrary, some of our second largest or third largest burn units are being closed. Then what happened? Actually, our system is uh, 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 like a centrally based. Referral comes directly to the center, that is towards the capital. That is why the number of uh, burn cases is increasing every day in our new hospital. I see, so that's, that's not sustainable, is it? Well, we're, we're getting sort of short on time. Um, uh, if we could go to my talk at this point, that'd be great. And I will be brief.
Mark, are you sharing your slides or do you want us to put them up? Uh, you know what, I'll just share it from, from my side. Oh, you got it, perfect. Okay, great. So uh, thank you so much for uh, you know, uh, pulling up the uh, sort of the end of the day, so please bear with me. Um, having been involved in a lot of the COVID discussions with respect to burn uh, internationally and having been involved in development of a you know, paper that I published early on with uh, quite a few folks, in, including uh, Nadim, or uh, sorry, Naeem, um, it's been an interesting story the last few months. So I'd, I'd like to share just sort of a global perspective. So number one, uh, we understand that burns in LMIC's big problem. More common in women and children, cooking injuries are common, industrial accidents are a big deal, but perhaps these diminished a little bit with decreased economic activity. So that's some of the background. And we all recognize that COVID is very resource intensive uh, because of the public health sorts of things that we have to do in order to protect ourselves, society ends up getting divided. Healthcare systems end up getting fragmented and separated. And in some cases, fear produces more resource constraint. So if you're a resource constrained environment to begin with, hoarding uh, and less availability, rising prices because of increased demand, uh, these are some of the compounding factors that will make burn care more difficult. And then if we put the two of these together, in many places, COVID has um, uh, been uh, uh, diminished in volume where COVID has been the highest density, but this is not always true as we've heard. Some centers are experiencing the combination of burns and COVID and sick and dying staff and closure of burn units. And so um, if you think about this for a second, I, I, I feel that the burn systems and um, their experience is a really important uh, reflection of the total system impact of COVID and pandemics on your system and its ability to be resilient. And I think this is a message that we need to communicate with, um, with our governments and with our societies. So um, uh, on the one hand, we have to continue to take care of burn patients, but in many burn units, uh, uh, burn staff have become involved with COVID care per se. So in the ideal situation, you know, this is what we'd like to be able to do. We'd, we'd like to be able to identify and cohort uh, patients with tests and adequate PPE. We'd like to maintain burn uh, uh, resources with a COVID-free burn unit with staff and patients. We'd like to assist with the regional COVID effort. And some have been successful in this way, and they've reported that we're looking at it. But, the, you know, the process is still evolving. If we look at new uh, cases um, uh, recently, we see, you know, there's a very concerning uh, increase uh, in, in volume in the United States, which of course makes me very, very nervous. Uh, and this is true in some of the places where the peaks have not yet been reached. If you look at uh, active cases, Israel, Japan, those are increasing, US, Mexico, Spain, so these are going up over the last seven days. Uh, similar uh, reports with respect to uh, confirmed uh, cases as well, deaths as well. And, uh, and so um, the situation is difficult. We've had millions of people dying and uh, um, are uh, getting sick and dying. And so uh, I feel like um, uh, there's this particular quote that I wanted to, to bring up because I think this is the sort of thing we need to hear right now. And I read this in this book, Good to Great, which I would highly recommend to everyone who is in a leadership position, uh, how to understand what really makes a great organization of any kind. I love this book. And one of the things that came out of it is this quote. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from an admiral who was in a... Um, was a prisoner of war for about seven years, I think, and was tortured many, many times during that, uh, that, that time. And he had been asked the question by this author of this book, um, who were the people who did not make it through this difficult time? And he said, ah, that's easy. It was the optimists. It was the people who told themselves, ah, this is going to be over quickly. We'll be home by Christmas. And those are the ones that ultimately became disillusioned, lost hope, and died. And so he said this, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose. So you must have this, this faith that you will prevail in the end, but you must not confuse that faith with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. And so this is referred to as the Stockdale paradox. When you're in a difficult situation, you must maintain unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. And, and as such, you have to be motivated to continue on no matter how difficult it is. But at the same time, you have to have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. 
And so here's what I think are some of the, uh, the brutal uh, realities of COVID and burns in LMICs. We thought burns in LMICs uh, were brutal before, but things could get worse because of constraints with respect to resources, because of demand, because of, not, uh, of uh, staff getting infected or dying. We thought COVID wouldn't come to LMICs and we were wrong. Resources are shrinking, not growing. The disease is threatening staff. Worse poverty because of uh, uh, lost revenue, lost productivity, shutdowns across economies. Poverty is probably going to get worse in some places for a period of time. There may be a global recession uh, or, or even depression. The burden will be even greater on the vulnerable. And we have really no idea when this is going to end. And this could happen again with a different uh, organism soon. And so uh, if we look at this again, we must maintain unwavering faith that we can and will prevail in the end, but we have to be disciplined and confront the brutal facts. And so here are some uh, thoughts from uh, my perspective, just having been you know, talking to lots of different people about this. I think uh, in some cases, your government, your ministry of health, your region may not have formal systems to connect people and to uh, get resources and information to the place where they need to be. And so some of that has to be done on your own. So connect and maximize information and such things as this webinar. Lots of these webinars have come to be and I think they've helped a lot. Learn from the present and evolve by collecting data locally and internationally. So I think uh, every person in a leadership position needs to be collecting data on what is going on right now, how the burn systems are being impacted by a pandemic and ways where systems need to evolve so that we can be more resilient in the future. Can the structure of uh, your healthcare system be made more resilient uh, for this sort of situation in the future? Maybe consider new structures uh, for movement of staff, supply, space, and patients. On the one hand, it could be government-based, but perhaps uh, you could consider some market-based um, uh, techniques for moving resources around. Uh, in, in a way that uh, res respects property rights and actually functions. So there could be some opportunity to innovate based on the needs that we've seen. And then we need to create more connectivity between nodes uh, in the network. Uh, I think uh, I'm really impressed with the work uh, in the UK. Uh, there's a fantastic uh, approach, in my opinion, from an American perspective of a network of, of, of experts who are in an authority position in order to make uh, decisions about the movement of patients across the UK. And uh, I, I wonder, um, I'd like to uh, open the mic of um, uh, Jorge Leon Villapalos. A lot of us have seen great responses from him recording through the course of the, of the talk today, but I'm just gonna go to my last slide first before I, I ask uh, him to speak for a moment. Um, uh, in the same way that I think it's important for people in a leadership position to be gathering the data on what's happening with you now, uh, we also um, need to be contributing to this from an international perspective. So there's a group of us representing UK, South Africa, many countries that have started a, um, a study, which we haven't rolled out yet, but that's going to look at some of these variables. And this can potentially be helpful to, to everybody as we communicate with our own governments and with our own societies. So I would uh, most welcome uh, contact from anyone who's interested in uh, getting involved in the study as well. But um, with respect to the, uh, the UK uh, approach to a, uh, a national network for dealing with uh, pandemic and burns, would it be okay to take just a minute or two uh, to open the mic of uh, Jorge? Yeah. Jorge is there, he should be able to do that himself, hopefully. Jorge, are you Yeah, there? Um, hello. Well, I hope that everyone can, can hear me. Yes, can hear you, Jorge. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Mark and, and colleagues. Uh, I apologize quite tremendously for uh, my background, which has been basically is greatly um, manipulated by, uh, by my children. And uh, I'll have it something just to say uh, just a few words about, about the role of, um, of the uh, UK. Essentially, the uh, response of the UK to the network pandemic was mainly uh, performed via a spirit of collaboration and mutual aid that was based in the UK Burns Network's role. Essentially, the Burns Network um, aimed to deliver a burn care service of the highest quality through four established uh, full burn networks that are uh, distributed along England and, um, and Wales. And these uh, four Burns Networks uh, collaboratively uh, work on a number of important national projects 
but these uh, birth networks effectively uh, collaborated together with the Spirit of Mutual Aid into the delivery of what we call uh, the National Burns COVID Plan. So what well, the National Burns COVID Plan established was through that Spirit of Mutual Aid, uh, trying to protect the resources of uh, um, uh, the different burns units, centers and facilities of the UK by designating and protecting two services that whatever it may come would be um, sheltered from admitting COVID patients and would continue delivering burn care, one in the uh, north of England, one in the southeast uh, of England. But I, I've got to say all of this actually has came together through a spirit of uh, collaboration, through a spirit of mutual aid and through a spirit of actually solidarity that allowed us um, to actually wade through the uh, COVID pandemic in the best way that we could. I must point out that the UK, like many other countries, was a certain stage overwhelmed um, in, by, by COVID. And there were many burns uh, facilities and centers that uh, had their resources taken over um, uh, by our health system in order to appropriately respond to the burns pandemic. But overall, and aided together by two factors, one, that is spirit of mutual aid, and also the, the general reduction in burn trauma uh, in the UK, we were able to little by little support each other, establishing a period of communication thoroughly um, and by and large uh, overcome uh, with uh, this spirit of solidarity, uh, the effects of pandemic. I hope that that provides uh, Mark and colleagues um, a perspective of what has been going on. I'd like also just to, uh, at this stage, um, express my gratitude and my admiration to the organizers of this fantastic meeting uh, in at a personal level say how privileged I am to have been um, involved uh, in uh, distributing basically is knowledge and experience with colleagues from all over the world and also thank the first and Barbaras and especially uh, Nadim uh, and my colleagues in organizing such an effort thank you very much Thank you, Jorge. Um, I wonder if it may be possible to share some of the design of the UK approach because uh, I think uh, some of the documents that you've produced would be great patterns for others who are developing their, their regional or national systems. Um, I hesitate to take very much more time. Uh, Patrick, I, I wonder if we could get your, your, your thoughts and cl closing comments on, on our session. We may have lost Patrick for a oh, moment. We may have lost him. He does have an internet connection problem, so... Uh, well, I'm going to turn the question then over uh, to Professor Adel and Professor Tanvir. Do you have any closing comments on, on our session? I'm not sure if I was heard. Did you guys hear me? <laughs> um, uh, personally, not. I, I don't. I don't have any 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 questions. Um, but um, um, I really uh, enjoyed this um, session, and uh, I think that um, we need to look a little bit more on um, how we're going to manage COVID patient and uh, and uh, and burns. And so far, um, just an idea of. Uh, um, of a research, um, I've seen. We, we we started to 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 swap all the patient coming plus with international injury um, because we have almost six international injury every day um, in a, in the world. And um, so far, uh, all of them have been negative. And I was asking my question myself: Is that due to? Um, it's impossible that we don't get uh, one positive. Is that the carbon monoxide neutralized the COVID? It's a question. Yeah, that's that's, that's a very so interesting concept. There's a lot concept. of research to be done there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think we're going to have to respect folks' time. It's been a, a great day overall. So, um, Nadim and the rest of the organizational crew, uh, Oren, thanks so much for a great day. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much, Mark, for, for this. Um, 
So really, uh, in summary, it's very challenging to summarize the whole day. We started off with, um, I'd like to thank everybody first off for participating, uh, those who attended um, and those who spoke and those who chaired sessions. And uh, I think we did an incredible job together considering that there have been uh, presenters and chairs from four continents. Um, it's really remarkable. Orin, can I interrupt for two seconds, just so people yeah. know, because some people may want to start disappearing. So the, next, the plan is we're going to hopefully wrap up in about the next six, seven minutes. Orin's just going to give a few minutes wrapping up the three sessions to give a little bit of a summary. Um, then Yvonne Wilson, who's the incoming chair of the BBA, is just going to take a few seconds. And then most importantly, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the feedback certificate. Et cetera. So we'll hopefully wrap up in about six, seven minutes. Thanks, Orin. Uh, thank you, Nadim. So we, we start out with uh, Naim explaining to us the importance of uh, burn injury and the fact that the Global Alliance for Clean Stoves, that uh, almost a half of the number of people who die from HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria die from smoke injury alone, regardless of burn. So it, it, it relates the huge uh, impact of uh, burn injury. And I am also emphasized the inadequacy of data and the need to collect good data to drive solutions. Um, and how poverty is closely linked with burn injury. And Kemi further emphasized this by saying that it's the least, those who are least able to afford it who are actually most affected by burn injury and the challenges of delays in referral. And Nikki has pointed out to us that um, many people are indeed quite uh, able to survive following injury and that prevention is very important and that we can use tools such as the radio and internet to disseminate messages of public health. Uh, Tarek related his huge experience in, uh, with uh, Burns and the need to uh, develop an infrastructure to adequately manage uh, large numbers of patients. He also emphasized the need to have health involvement and he also emphasized the MDT. John then took us through uh, her approach and uh, that of Interburns as a modular approach uh, to training. Um, in the second session, and I'd like to thank my co-chair uh, Richard for uh, uh, co-chairing that session. Um, in the second session, we had Naeem and Mosam uh, chairing and this related to the multidisciplinary team. And Opoku told us that it's so important that we should treat the patient with dignity. And he also emphasized that it's important not to let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Uh, Mike um, told us that there are simple instruments that we use, but we also need to have a simple and effective process to use these tools. He also told us that somebody who is interested in burn care is like a diamond. Nicole, uh, representing the nurses, encouraged the involvement of nurses in this symposium and told us that the nurse is the glue that keeps the disciplinary team together and one which I would personally strongly approach. Um, Pratiba gave us a very structured view on the importance and the approach to nutrition following burn injury. And Ruth Ann emphasized to us the importance of focusing on quality of life outcomes um, uh, and using tricks and tools like playing with balloons and using gutter splints to improvise and um, develop strategies for improving a burn outcome. And she also emphasized that a wound that takes longer to heal is more likely to have problems. Um, in our just COVID session, uh, chaired by uh, Mark and uh, um, Patrick, we, we heard uh, really information that's uh, so fresh and, and uh, so important. Uh, Tanvir showed us that significant changes were required to address uh, the, the uh, COVID crisis, uh, including strategies of uh, separating streams and uh, autoclaving uh, PPE. And this was further emphasized by Adil in his excellent talk, uh, where he again uh, developed uh, different uh, pathways for patient care. And he emphasized that the COVID positive burn patient is best treated in a burns unit. 
And Mark has uh, further um, elucidated the need to develop wider critical resilience capacity. Um, and important that both to keep uh, a belief in faith in success coupled with a discipline to address the challenges of failure. Jorge then told us his experience using burn networks to develop strategy for COVID management uh, in burn patients. And so today we've had uh, 1,300 people register for this meeting from five continents, for all, every continent <laughs> on the planet. Um, and I, I think that's just a huge testament to the importance of uh, burn care. There are 75 countries have been represented. We've had over 100 questions. Uh, we've had so many comments, all of which have been uh, incredibly uh, positive about our speakers. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to quote um, from Ruth Ann's uh, slide. And she said, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. So on behalf of all of the uh, organizing committee, I'd like to particularly thank the chair of our committee, uh, Nadine. Um, I'd like to thank our, all our colleagues at the BBA, BFIRST and BAPRAS for, and everyone who's here for participating, for making this such a success today. Thank you. Cheers, Oren. Thanks for that. So uh, yeah, I wonder if the message of the conference is going to be about the mosquito. I, uh, I do like that one. I'm uh, going to very quickly uh, pass over to uh, Yvonne Wilson from Birmingham in UK, who's uh, uh, about to become the incoming chair of the British Burn Association. Just say a few closing words before I definitely wrap the event up. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, Nadine. Thank you. Um, so I think Oren has probably said a lot of what needs to be said this afternoon. Um, it's been a great afternoon. Um, BBA Uh, Yvonne, you may have gone on to mute, Yvonne. There you go. Yeah, Perfect. I think you muted me. Um, so, I mean, BBA are very grateful that you've included us um, in this, which has essentially been organised by yourself with your team, Be First and Backras. Um, so it, it's really nice to be included in both today and um, next week's sessions. Um, it's, I know it's been huge work, Nadim, for yourself and your team. And all the speakers um, have been excellent must have spent a long time preparing all of that information that we heard. And it's just really important to collaborate, particularly at times like this. Um, the knowledge on COVID that we heard just at the last session is invaluable. And I think um, there's stuff there for us all to, to work on and to think about and good um, information as to what we should all be gathering and looking at in our own units. Um, I know there's a number of BBA members have been involved today and I think it was a bit telling in the first poll that 80% of the people involved are actually doctors of some sort. So I think the, the main contribution that BBA can make even between now and next week is to make sure that our, the rest of our multidisciplinary team know about next week's webinar and just to try and encourage more um, engagement from the other members of the team because there, there's lots to learn not just for the not just for the medical staff um, and I think um, maybe the medical staff are the ones that hear about things more and tend to register but we should talk to all of our teams about next week's session I think that would be a great opportunity for them and it's a great opportunity to collaborate communicate internationally and take home those messages which Oren has summarized um, so well, there's, there's a lot to learn today and I'm very grateful um, for the BBA's involvement in it. So thank you very much to all of the organisers. Thanks Yvonne, uh, that's uh, lovely to hear your uh, sort of uh, overview thoughts on that. I'm just going to take uh, the last two minutes of your time as a prayer, uh, privilege as uh, being the chair. Uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, taken part, it's been an absolute privilege meeting so many new people online. In these strange times of not being able to shake hands and see each other face to face, met a lot of new friends in the UK and uh, in particular overseas. It's just been absolutely phenomenal the amount of people who've wanted to help 
uh, put this session together. Yes, we've all done some hard work, but without the faculty, the chairs, the speakers, and of course the audience who've given up four and a half hours of your time, uh, you know, wouldn't have been able to do anything. And that's because we're all dedicated to trying to help Burns patients moving forward. So I think that's a testament to everybody's uh, time and effort. Uh, the next um, webinar, the second of this uh, series of two, is on the 8th of August. So thankfully it's three weeks away, which gives us a little bit of breathing space after today. So it's three weeks on today, Saturday, and it's on later care, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and of course, perhaps most importantly, prevention. Um, so similar format to next week. So if you've not registered, if you could consider doing that, that would be wonderful. And um, just if I can bring your attention to the email address at the top of the slide, info at bfus.org.uk. If you send an email to that, we'll add you to the mailing list for further future events, which we're planning at the moment. And we'll be very keen to get your feedback about future events and this webinar. And therefore, if you're able to fill in the uh, survey at the end, the feedback about the speakers and the sessions, uh, that would be lovely. And of course, once we've got that, we can send you your um, certificate of attendance, which we'll probably get to after a week or so. It usually takes at least a week uh, to get all the feedback and so on. So that just remains me to say thank you very much for your participation today. Lots of questions, lots of chat, which has been great. And hopefully we'll see you in three weeks time. So I say thank you to everybody. Cheers. I think that's, uh, that's where we'll end.